Welcome to another show, Twin Trouble, your source for 100% verified takes on the entropy of U.S. empire and culture. I'm Jason. And I'm Jeremy. And we are... Twin Trouble! It's clear we're living in an era of decline, of collapse, of stochastic terror, and rising fascism. Worse yet, this is also the era of grifts. And today, we're pulling no punches. We're calling out the frauds. Wikipedia describes crypto-fascism as the secret support for, or admiration of, Fascism, or trends, very closely related to the ideology. The term is used to imply that an individual or group keeps the support or admiration hidden. It's a rebranding tactic, like calling themselves freedom fighters. They use dog whistles to larger audiences in order to red pill normies towards fascism. We're calling out that fake-ass anarcho-polko scene, the crypto-conspiracist colonizers at the heart of the HBO docuseries The Anarchists and their follow-up cringe-fest anarcho-covid. We'll also be talking about the Libertarian Party. Kind of this toxic dumping ground ideology underpinning this fraudulent freedom movement. We'll be looking at its increasing fascistification with the Mises Caucus takeover earlier this year. Finally, we'll be looking at the king grift of them all, the scam that is crypto. Bitcoin, DeFi, Web3. It's been major L's for Ponzi schemes these days. There's been hundreds of collapses, but this month saw the biggest so far. FTX, their CEO Sam Bankman-Fried was just arrested. The crypto capitalism house of cards is all falling apart. Hundreds of billions gone, everybody just lost their money, and more cascading collapses are coming. We've got a great guest to help sort this all out. Molly White, who runs Web3 is going just great, joining us for a deep dive into this toxic scene to dissect the dumpster fires and failed promises, and what this all means for the so-called future of the web. We've got another guest as well, Cooper Quinton with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. He's an old school hacker, good friends of ours. Going to be talking about circumventing government surveillance and just talking in general about some of the hacktivist happenings around the world. We're bringing both of them on for commentary on the contours of the crisis we're living in and what role and responsibility ethical technologists should be playing. It's a hell of a timeline. What happened to the promise of a liberatory techno-utopia? Billionaire tech tycoons got us trapped up in their financial matrix, selling us crude parodies of our own ideals as we endlessly mine for virtual fake gold in their metaverses. No future, but total ecological destruction. The cyberpunk dream turned out to be a dystopian nightmare. Welcome to... Crypto In remembrance of our dear friend and comrade Marco Quiroz, we dedicate this podcast to his life. Marco Apocalypto was a well-loved anarchist punk from Chicago via Mexico. He sang in the legendary hardcore punk band Traste Nada, old schoolers who influenced the next generation of punks. We're honoring him by featuring his music in this podcast along with his bandmate's current project, Quebranto. Punk's not dead, up the motherfucking punks. Ya va a ser 
Before we get to the interviews, a quick celebration of what's coming up here in our home state. So Illinois is leading the way with the passage of the Safety Act, including the Pretrial Fairness Act. It's a historic bill advocated by a network coalition of abolitionist orgs. In addition to plenty of important criminal justice reforms which have already begun to be implemented, the abolition of cash bail is set to go in effect on January 1st. We're stoked to see people free from hell holes like Cook County Jail, who finally no longer have to be assumed guilty until proven innocent no longer have to sit in jail waiting for trial just because they can't afford the bail. Illinois has suffered not only from mass incarceration, but from the mass disinformation campaign that sought to maintain the prison systems. Pro-police news fills the TV stations and mainstream media each night to convince people or present the appearance for the need for the police. So-called reporting on crime is almost always one-sided verbatim takes from the mouths of cops. But a new wave of copaganda arose specifically to beat back the Pretrial Fairness Act, most egregiously with these pink slime publications, made-up papers, literal fake news. Tens of thousands of copies were sent to doorstops all across Illinois, filled with far-right algorithmic content, mugshots, falsities, and fascist panic. Many people who received this shit did not realize it was merely the results of a $42 million midterm donation to People Who Play By The Rules, a Florida-based pack. They tried to weaponize racism and transphobia, calling this the purge saying that police can no longer detain people, spreading all these lies just to keep in place this racist and classist prison system. These Republicans, Darren Bailey, Tom DeVore, Dan Proft, Paul Vallis, even Blagojevich, all these clowns were out there making fools of themselves, and it failed for them spectacularly in the midterms, here in Illinois nationwide as voters rejected the tough-on-crime election sloganeering. The simple fact of the matter is the PFA is eliminating one of the most blatant injustices embedded in the prison system. That whether somebody has a financial ability to pay the cash bail or not, that will no longer be a determining factor whether somebody is imprisoned pending their trial. Because right now, you got people just languishing for months, years even. Not because you've been convicted of a crime because it's pretrial. Not because they've been denied bail because of flight risk or perceived danger to the public, but just because poor folks can't afford the bail. The system collects this money, the rich people walk while everyone else got to sit and suffer. Well, that ain't right, and it's got to stop. So we're excited that Illinois is leading the way to finally end this discriminatory practice. This is one law we could actually get behind. The Safety Act and PFA goes live on January 1st. We'll be covering the rollout in future podcasts. Twin Trouble is part of the Channel Zero Network. Are you like us, constantly craving more anti-capitalist content? Well, then head on over to Channel Zero, a great group of anti-authoritarian podcasters covering a wide variety of interests. We got Kite Line, 12 Rules for What, Maroon Cast, Live Like the World is Dying, Grounded Futures, Indigenous Action, Dissident Island, Coffee with Comrades, This is America, and The Final Straw. All right, today we have another special guest, Molly White. She's a knowledgeable and prolific critic of crypto, a self-described anti-crypto voice. Her site, Web3, is going just great, details the griff that is the whole scene, which is routinely plagued by scams and collapse. Molly, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for you? having me. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? We're here. We're great. We're having a great view of the dumpster fire. A hell of a timeline. 
uh, that Web3, uh, your coverage of this has been top notch. Much respects to your work. We do want to ask you all about FTX and uh, all the stuff that happened this past month. But, you know, people ask you all that time. You know, we're not crypto people, right? We're not generally like in that scene. But we do have some, uh, me and my brother, we actually went to the Bitcoin conference, right? That was kind of funny. We had to see for ourselves. You know, I went to prison, I did a lot of time. And, uh, you know, when I was out, Bitcoin was kind of just Silk Road era, like $10 a coin type of thing, right? And it was kind of like this cool underground feel, right? You know, a lot has happened since I've been gone. I just kind of try to keep an open mind about it because people ask me all the time. You know, we, we're not investors. We don't have any speculators in crypto or any of that stuff. But we, me and my brother, we did go to the Bitcoin conference. I also went to uh, NYC NFT conference. And just we had to see for ourselves, and it was uh, pretty nauseating, pretty toxic. Have you uh, yourself felt any type of way rubbing shoulders with some of these crypto people? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's kind of this like constant feeling that they're trying to sell you something. Um, it's hard to have just like a straightforward conversation with people sometimes that are really deep in it because it becomes just like so ideological and so sales pitchy like so quickly mm -hmm. so it is it is a very weird scene especially when you end up talking to some of the people who are like really in it you know they're not just the dabblers but they have really devoted themselves to it um it can be a really weird experience yeah the true believers they got like that glazed look in their eyes trying to sell you something right um, <laughs> now as techies right like um you're a fantastic coder um you're an actual techie you know what i'm saying like and uh, one of my experiences is going to this thing is this whole consultant speak, right? All these acronyms mm -hmm. and they, they try to keep like their knowledge kind of like in the in cult type of language, right? It's kind of like to outsiders, it almost is like, and, and I know tech, you know what I'm saying? It's like, and I hear these red flags just going off. Like, you're just full of shit, man. Just stop it, man. You're full of shit. You don't even know what you're talking about, right? Like, and this whole <laughs> fraud is kind of this big theme that we have this episode. And we were going to ask you actually what your opinions are, generally speaking, like the crossover between the tech industry and the crypto industry, culturally, politically, we're going to get all into all that. So do you want to talk about a brief summary of FTX? And then we want to ask, like, how does this compare and contrast to traditional financial schemes and collapses? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so FTX, you know, is a huge crypto exchange. I think it was the second largest crypto exchange up until recently. And, you know, there was this guy, Sam Bankman-Fried, who had founded it. He also ran a quantitative trading firm called Alameda Research. And, you know, recently FTX completely collapsed. There was sort of a run on the exchange where a bunch of people tried to all withdraw their crypto because of concerns about the solvency of the exchange. And it turned out that there was basically this enormous hole in their balance sheet of, you know, billions of dollars and they've been unable to continue processing withdrawals. They've filed for bankruptcy. And Sam bankman fried has been replaced as CEO by someone who's going to now try to unwind the chaos that was FTX. But, you know, it was basically this big fall from grace from a cryptocurrency exchange that was considered generally to be one of the more above board crypto exchanges. You know, it was an offshore exchange that had a much more limited U.S. offering, but it did have, you know, major mainstream appeal they had super bowl ads they bought a stadium in miami the, the ftx stadium wow. you know people really knew about it and thought it was like this legit thing and then it turned out it was just a whole bunch of what now is beginning to look a lot like fraud behind the scenes yeah you remember those uh fortune cookies the ftx fortune cookies like yeah that was ridiculous right i know that just seems like such a bottom of the barrel thing you know like your family is trying to enjoy some nice takeout and your kid opens the fortune cookie and it's like buy crypto you 12 year old you know yeah, so i do weird. remember that oh wow that shit was ridiculous though how low can you go right like how the mighty have fallen yeah like. yeah so is this kind of like a unique thing though fds because i mean like you've covered like hundreds and hundreds of these collapses they yeah. keep wanting like, to look at like this, like what, how, how could this have gone wrong? But this is just kind of the model. This is just kind of like the standard bearer. Like. Yeah, I mean, I think the uniqueness really is just the scale of it. You know, this is one of, by far, one of the largest collapses that we've seen to date. But I do think it is really typical, you know, and, and now that FTX collapsed, people in the crypto industry are really trying to paint FTX as this total outlier. You know, it's just this one guy who is scamming everybody, but it's not crypto, you know, it's not the real technology. It was just this guy running this centralized exchange. 
But I think it actually is completely, you know, representative of crypto. Mm -hmm. I mean, this happens all the time, just at sort of smaller scales. And, you know, with crypto, it's pretty easy to do a lot of fraud behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And then it only becomes apparent when the whole ship begins to sink. But, you know, I think I would be really surprised if there aren't other crypto firms out there that are doing just as shady stuff mm -hmm. as FTX was. And, you know, we just don't know about it at this point. I, I think it's actually completely normal in the right. industry for things to be happening <clears throat> like we're happening with FTX. And you know, people have started to ask the question now of like, how did we not see this coming? There are all these red flags. You know, FTX had this really close relationship with Alameda, the trading firm. And realistically, there should not be such a conflict of interest where those are being operated by the same person. Mm -hmm. uh, and so people are like, how do we not see this coming? And if you talk to people in the crypto industry, you know, who are being honest with you, at least, they'll say that, well, of course, we didn't see it coming because all the crypto exchanges have red flags like that. And it's like, yeah, that's a problem. You know, that is, you know, shows that this is actually quite illustrative of the crypto industry and is not an outlier because a lot of firms are doing really weird stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a house of cards, right? The whole token value thing, just everybody got to have a token. And uh, now that this dumpster fire went up, they're all looking something external to themselves, right? Not like the predictable outcome of the design uh, or Bitcoin Maximus or like, oh, it's shit coins or it's or some conspiracy yeah. theories and yeah it's, it's wild to see all the different things people are saying to try to like distance themselves from it you know the bitcoiners are just saying oh this wouldn't have happened with bitcoin some of the people in the ethereum ecosystem are saying oh this was all because it was centralized and these decentralized projects wouldn't have had this problem you know everyone's sort of pointing at something to say that this is totally mm -hmm. out of you know out of the blue we couldn't have seen it coming and it has no you know, it doesn't reflect on the crypto industry as a whole, which I think is completely mm -hmm. self-serving and, and not true. Just another fraud, just another grift like the rest of them. One thing that was unique about this FTX thing was in the aftermath, it seemed like that, that there was a lot of conspiracy theories uh, surrounding SBF's donations to the Democratic Party, whether he was helping co-author like regulations about Bitcoin and all these like theories about like, oh, they're funneling money through the Ukraine and uh, to fund democratic midterms and all that stuff and all this kind of like ridiculous notions you know anything about that yeah i mean i think people get really conspiratorial about this stuff especially when it starts to touch american politics which obviously ftx is really involved in but you know i think you know people were coming up with all these theories about yeah like he was laundering money for the democrats to send to ukraine you know it's like that didn't even really make any sense you know it's like why why would that even happen why would the democrats even do that and then it came out later you know he has said that he actually donated basically an equal amount to republicans through basically dark donations that he didn't disclose and so Mm -hmm. I think that sort of falls apart. I mean, t to be fair, there's no easy way to verify that he's not just lying about that. And mm -hmm. I think at this point, we would need to take everything he says with a grain of salt. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the sort of more obvious explanation here is that he just did a lot of fraud and the donations were, you know, a part of him trying to buy influence to some extent. Yeah. He um, admit in some of the leaked text messages that like, oh, this whole effective altruism thing was just a front. And and it's like we get a lot of this from like these billionaires who just like want to like wrap some of the evil things that they do within the language of, oh, I'm also a philanthropist. And, you know, stuff like Jeff Bezos say, oh, I'm going to give all my money to the causes before I'm dead. You know what I'm saying? It's like, well, you know what? You fucking rich asshole made billions during the pandemic. You know what I mean? And, and now this SBF yeah. guy is like. Just because you fit into these different causes and stuff like that, that doesn't absolve you from some of the other terrible things and these business decisions that you're making that are also ruining all these people's lives. You know, this right. is a, this is a yeah, big. Yeah, no, he seems to have this very sort of utilitarian view on things, <clears throat> where it's like, even if he was making money at the expense of other people, it was all worth it in the end because he was somehow the better donator you know he's the better philanthropist and so it was fine if he took your money because he could do better things with it than you could which is like such a cynical and sociopathic way yeah. of thinking i feel like yeah no i mean generally though crypto uh, overall has been a, i mean there's been supports for a lot of uh, republicans and, and and there's articles in the early days of uh the rise of bitcoin and stuff like that specifically funding white supremacy like a lot of alt-right and nazis made bank early on right like nick fuentes and like weave and all them clowns mm -hmm. and so just kind of generally yeah, I mean, they still do <laughs> yeah 
Um, FDX, his right hand man, also gave like millions to like top Republicans and so forth, right? Peter Thiel, of course, is a huge supporter of right wing fascist movements, GOP politicians. You know, recently, crypto, I mean, not recently, but in more recent years, crypto has become more of a part of like mainstream political talking points in the US, where like there are now senators and Congress people who are adopting crypto as a part of their political platform. By and large, those are the Republicans that are doing it. There's a handful of Democrats, too, who have sort of hopped on the train there. But, you know, there's a lot of uh, Republicans who are saying things, at least that are very pro Bitcoin, pro crypto, if not, you know, actually legislating and, and campaigning for it. And so it's definitely become sort of a, a major part of the political sphere as well. And I think it does, you know, jive pretty well with some of the right wing talking points about like, you know, we don't need to tax us, we want to be free to do whatever we want with our money, you know, no government mm. intervention at all, those types of things, you know, they do jive to some extent with the crypto ethos. Although, you know, some of them are a little bit more authoritarian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's kind of ironic, right? Because this Bitcoin kind of freedom movement they're talking about is generally about like, oh man, they don't want to tax us or regulate us or even like some anti-vax stuff, right? And a couple other right-wing talking points, right? But at the same time, to me, it's kind of funny. Uh, going back to like the role of crypto in politics and in the fallout of the SBF stuff, like obviously people are going to say, oh, regulation now is really on the way. Now it's now it's coming, right? Now, got all these Congress people are talking about all this shit, right? And it's, but then again, it's like, aren't there already kind of like existing regulations and laws meant to like insider trading and Ponzi schemes and securities fraud, monopolies? And, I mean, companies have always just been taking yeah, advantage. I, mean, I, like, I feel like people, when crypto is involved, it's like they forget that it's illegal to steal money from people. You know, it's like they think that if there isn't a really specific crypto focused piece of legislation, then everything goes, you know, you can, you can do whatever you want. You can run a Ponzi scheme. You can just steal people's money. And it's like, no, you still can't just like steal money from people that is still illegal. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that those, you know, those actual laws have not been heavily enforced is pretty weird. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also, you know, existing laws around securities regulations that have not really been enforced because there's been so much, you know, pushback, I guess, against labeling a lot of these tokens, which are quite clearly securities as securities. I mean, mm -hmm. hard to argue that the tokens that are you know, really tied to these exchanges like FTT with the FTX exchange are not just securities. I mean, they, they behave basically in every way like a security. And so there could have been regulatory actions around those under the existing securities regime, but there wasn't, you know, there just, there wasn't any action there. Um, so, you know, I think that the claims that, oh, it's, we need regulation, we need regulatory clarity. It's like, we have that. We do, we just need enforcement and, you know, investigations, you know, that are not happening today. Mm. Well, that's a good point because uh, it's kind of a common criticism of the fact that these big banks and stuff like that are too big to jail, right? Like the United States hasn't really gone after any of these corporate criminals. They just get away with it. And of course, the law is such a way that they got front groups and dark money, like you had mentioned earlier. And even the times that they do, right, like, you, very rarely do you see them, any of them go to jail. I mean, let's be clear, like, the right. this whole prison system is not meant to be locking up, like, Congress people and, and corporate executives. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, and that's what's been happening in the crypto industry, too. We'll see these fines, you know, against crypto companies that are just, it's like pennies to them. I mean, there's, there's no substantial fines being levied. There's obviously no criminal charges coming down. And so people, you know, it just becomes a cost of doing business where if you're fined by the SEC, then you just pay the fine and you keep on going. And, there, you know, that doesn't actually stop anyone from doing anything. And it doesn't keep anyone from being scammed. Mm -hmm. It's it's completely ineffective. Right. And let it not be said, like, of all this talk of crime and fraud and stuff like that, like, the, the largest form of crime, property crime specifically, that's going on in the United States is not shoplifting, it's not turnstile jumping, it's wage theft, right? Like, it's, it's companies just criminally underpaying working people to the tune of billions of dollars and stuff like that, right? And they're just getting away with it. But at the same time, like, you know, the criminal system is set up in a way that, you know, people are often talking about SBF. How is he still out? How is he still free and stuff like that? Well, it's like, well, you know, the, the system kind of punishes others more harshly than others. You know what I'm saying? Like, look at the uh, Khalif Browder right. case. Khalif Browder, for example, spent three years pre-trial in Rikers Island for stealing a backpack, right? Because he couldn't afford bail, right? 
but all these rich fucks just get away with this shit, man. They they got appeals bonds and all that, you know. It's just looking at like Trump and all that stuff, like just getting away with crimes in front of the whole world. And you think about all the people in prison. And so when I hear people like, oh, socialism, oh, taxes, oh, uh, and, and it's really, they're just trying to defend like a company's right to run sweatshops, man. Like they're just trying to defend like a company. Uh, so I don't know. I, I always thought that the regulation was never really going to be a serious way of keeping any of these companies and these crypto stuff in check in the first place because they're in cahoots. Why I see it anyways. Right. Yeah. And I mean, if you, I mean, if you just look at the amount of money that's going into crypto lobbying, you know, I think it, it kind of explains a lot of why there hasn't been much in the way of legislation or regulatory action. The crypto industry is very well funded and they can pay lawyers to basically either stall these legal proceedings practically indefinitely or get them out with a slap on the wrist. And so, you know, that's what we see is, is people who have, you know, people like Sam being afraid, people who have these millions, if not billions of dollars, just, you know, paying their way out of things pretty much and getting a, a pretty light slap on the wrist compared to, you know, other forms of crime, which mm -hmm. is, I think, you know, somewhat typical of banking and, and these large industries that are very lucrative and that have very close ties to the government and to the regulatory agencies. But, you know, it's, it's clearly not working well for the actual you know, average people who are being told that this is a system that's good for them, that mm -hmm. this is a way for them to make money. You know, they're getting completely screwed over because people are able to really do whatever they want with, with very little consequence. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, kind of reminds me of a quote a quote of yours that I heard when talking about all this in a talk that you were, you were given, someone was talking about, oh, well, you know, it's a new industry and just billions come and go and, um, you know, you need to break a few plates, right? And you said, those plates are people, right? This isn't just some abstract stuff. A lot of people lost everything, right? Right. Yeah, that's one thing that really frustrates me, not just about crypto, but honestly about the tech industry in general, is there's this theory of like move fast and break things, right? Like I think that was Zuckerberg or whatever who yeah. says that a lot. And it's like, okay, if we're talking about move fast and break things in the sense of like occasionally you write a bug in your software and it takes your server offline, like fine, that's fine. But if breaking things means like absolutely ruining people or, you know, look at any of these like huge impacts that the tech industry has had on society, like, you know, causing complete civil unrest in the terms of social media companies or like this widespread surveillance, you know, it's like move fast and break things doesn't really hold up there when we're talking about, you know, completely wiping out someone's life savings, you know, they can't pay their medical bills, they can't pay for their kids tuition, they can't, you know, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. You have to remember that things here can be very different <laughs> depending on the actual industry. Yeah, so yeah, it was Charles Hoskinson who said, we, in order for the crypto industry to move forward, we've got to break a few plates. And it's like he completely separates himself from the fact that those are actual people, you know, who are putting money off and that they can't afford to lose into the crypto industry. And I mean, Charles Hoskinson runs a huge blockchain project. He has billions of dollars or millions of dollars, I guess. You know, he's sort of laughed during that same talk about how yet yeah, like, oh, yeah, the crypto collapse affected me, too. I lost two million dollars. And like. Most people don't have $2 million that they can just lose. Like, my heart is not breaking for you, Charles Hoskinson, because mm. some of your enormous wealth was, you know, evaporated. Yeah, man, that's, that's pretty fucked up, though. Uh, and like you said, it, it kind of just highlights the fact that people are very much affected differently. In regular capitalism, but also in this whole crypto casino capitalism thing, too, like the rich can kind of afford to take these ridiculous losses. And, and the scale, to me, is just so unfathomable, because I ain't no millionaire. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it's just so much. Like millions, billions. In 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 Charles's case, right? Uh, the fact that he lost millions. I don't know. I kind of want to ask you the inverse of this question. Isn't it when it's like these rich assholes getting their ha their wallets hacked or their apes stolen? All my apes gone. It's a little funny. Like it's a little poetic justice, <laughs> right? Like you're punching up. Is there some argument for that? Really, I'm actually advocating for a specific tactic here, right? And this whole looking at this whale crypto thing like to me they're just a bunch of walking marks and i say man like i know maybe you're just contributing to the overall just negativity of the the ecosystem as a whole but man i say if you ain't got shit man go fucking hack these whales wallets man and take that shit man <laughs> maybe maybe dust everybody's accounts that they that they've wronged you know what i'm saying like just just on some robin hood stuff you know 
Yeah, I mean, it is, you know, the, the one thing about running my project is, you know, where I keep track of scams and hacks and things like that is, like, some of it is very funny. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the ones that I laugh at are usually, like, the millionaires who did something so dumb or who just ended up trying, you know, falling for the most obvious scam because they're not the ones who can't put food on the table at the end of the day, right? You know, if, if someone loses a million dollars that they spent on an ape JPEG, you know, chances are they're having no trouble paying their rent, right? But some of them, you know, it's hard to laugh. You know, they're really upsetting because it is people who spent, you know, their last hundred bucks because they were told that this is their way out of poverty. Hmm. You know, and those those I don't laugh at because it's really upsetting to see people get basically taken for a ride and then end up in pretty dire circumstances in some cases. But yeah, I mean, going back to your point about millionaires being marks, I think that's one thing that people don't necessarily realize in the crypto ecosystem is that like when anyone can see your wallet and they can see that you have $2 million worth of some cryptocurrency, like you become such a huge target. We've seen it with the Bored Apes as well. Like the Bored Ape ecosystem has been targeted probably more than any other NFT project for these weird phishing scams. You know, there were these things around like, click this link and we'll animate your ape for you. So now your your JPEG will like dance around or whatever. And like a ton of people fell for it. And it, you know, it's because Bored Apes, you know, that go for hundreds of thousands of dollars People want to steal those. And so it's kind of like you're just walking around with a huge like wad of cash in your hands. And I think people don't really realize, you know, the the risk that they're opening themselves up to when they do those kinds of things. I actually wanted to pick your brain about some of the specifics on some of the methods that people be uh, hacking in the security and the blockchain. But uh, but maybe that's a, a different conversation. I encourage people to check out these solidity contracts and stuff like that because uh, I'll be reading sometimes and how like weaknesses have just been sitting there for years just waiting for somebody to just exploit and just utterly drain an entire market in a matter of minutes. Like, yeah. And anybody can do it. I don't know. Yeah, it's like the biggest bug bounty out there. You know, <laughs> it's like you hack that thing and you get the entire contents of the crypto wallet that belongs to this project. I mean, it's so obvious why there's so much hacking happening in this space is you can make incredible amounts of money at it. Mm -hmm. And it's generally not prosecuted or you know, there isn't much in the way of resources. And so projects have been really, you know, hacked profusely and it's very lucrative for some of these hackers. Mm. It's kind of going along with the whole criminalized darknet type of thing, right? I want to ask about use cases and stuff like that. I know you get asked about this shit all the time. But one thing is like, is it still a useful tool for, you know what I'm saying, uh, criminalized people like sex workers or even like the drug markets and stuff like that? And maybe even a lot of these mainstream crypto people keep trying to put that off to the side, even though that kind of paved the way for all their casino shit. But what is the state of this darknet scene right now, if you know anything? Or, or you don't have to answer that question only. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think there is still use for it in the criminal side of things. Like, it's still used for ransomware pretty heavily. You know, it's used for various darknet markets. But I think that increasingly criminals are moving away from things like Bitcoin and towards other forms of cryptocurrency because the tracing has become pretty sophisticated at this point. So, you know, back in the you know, early 2010s when people were like buying weed off of the Silk Road, you know, chances are there wasn't going to be some internet detective at the FBI knocking on your door because you could obfuscate who you were pretty easily with Bitcoin, especially if you were like buying Bitcoins from some person that you met rather than, you know, there weren't like the coin bases where you had to go and upload your driver's license photo so that you could connect your real life bank account and then buy Bitcoins. You know, it was very private back then. These days, you know, people really have to work to keep their identities private uh, much more than they used to with the with these centralized exchanges and these, you know, on ramps. Um, and, uh, you know, there are these tools, you know, I mean, there's, there's an entire industry now of uh, companies that create tracing tools that they then sell to the government and to various other agencies so that they can track down people who are sending Bitcoin around. And so it is more difficult these days to commit crimes, I think, or to 
purchase illicit substances or whatever you might be doing with cryptocurrencies. You have to be really thoughtful about it. Um, and I actually think that we're starting to see people who were involved in crimes, you know, back in the early 2010s or whatever, now being discovered because those tools have evolved over time and the crime that they committed that maybe they got away with a while ago has now been uncovered because chainalysis exists mm. and the FBI wow. has resources or whatever it might be. Wow, that's pretty scary, actually. Um, and, uh, and you know, fuck those dudes who are uh, working at the FBI or these private cybersecurity firms and stuff like that, like trying to go back 10 years and trying to trace these motherfuckers. That's, that's some shit. I, I know a piece of shit like that, by the way. Chris Tarball, the FBI agent who busted both me and Ross Albrecht, he's now a crypto cybersecurity dude trying to get in on that grift. So fuck all these fake ass uh, technologists, right, working to de-anonymize people. But I think it's really actually, I think it's something that's like very much under appreciated people aren't paying enough attention to that that like because bitcoin or whatever crypto has this public ledger that never goes away you know if you do something with bitcoin today and you get away with it that doesn't necessarily mean that in five years or ten years the technology won't have evolved to the point that people can actually trace it and those le those records are probably still going to be there you know and so it's the same thing when people start talking about putting data on the blockchain for various reasons. You know, people start talking about storing various forms of private data. You know, it's even like medical records and, and scary shit like that with Web3. And they're like, no, 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 we'll just encrypt it and then no one will you know, be able to figure out what it actually says. And it's like, okay, so now you're sort of putting out this encrypted blob of data and then just sort of hoping that that encryption is good forever. You know, in most industries, you try to add layers of security around really sensitive data. So you would encrypt it, but you would also store it in a private data store and you would put all these controls behind it. And in the crypto industry, they're like, just put it out there, <laughs> you know, put it on this public ledger. And then, you know, who knows if those encryption algorithms turn out to be flawed, which has happened. I mean, just yeah. look at the history of, uh, computer science, yeah. there have been, you know, encryption algorithms that have been broken, um, then, you know, you are just counting on, you know, people not caring enough to go and look at your medical records. So it's a really scary sort of like permanent uh, decision that people don't always realize the, I think, implications of. Mm. Yeah, I don't know why they would at the same time talk about the whole promise of anonymity, but at the same time, let's just put everything out there in a public dump. And like you said, they quantum computing, they cracked that shit years later off. And to me, that was like one of the biggest disappointments, the biggest lie of this whole crypto uh, Bitcoin dream that they're trying to sell us, right? Is the promise of anonymity. Like, what a joke. And also the promise of decentralization, which are, you know, two things that are very important to right. anarchist autonomous movements. One of the reasons why maybe in the early days people were interested in it, and I was, I thought that was kind of cool in the early days, right? But when you put the magnifying glass and you see how their ideologies and the underlying technologies <laughs> didn't live up to the dream, right? Like, Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. You know, when I first heard of Bitcoin, I was, you know, it was in the early 2010s or something. And I remember hearing about it as like, this is how we're going to be able to fund whistleblowers. You know, it was like, at that point, it was like WikiLeaks was being funded with Bitcoin because all of the credit card agencies had stopped processing payments for them. And so it was like, you know, this is the way that we're going to make it so that, you know, even if there's a regime that's trying to crack down on someone, you know, people can still support them or whatever. And I was like, that makes some sense. You know, I kind of get why people might want to like send money outside of the, you know, controls of Visa or whatever. But that's largely not what crypto is today. You know, there are still people on the fringes who talk about that kind of stuff. And there are a lot of people who sort of co-opt those types of talking points mm -hmm. in order to talk up their particular crypto scheme, whatever it is, even though often it turns out to be a really empty talking point. But those sort of early ideological points have sort of been overshadowed by the amount of venture capital, the amount of just like retail capital going into the space. People get these dollar signs in their eyes and they sort of you know, forget about a lot of the ideological points. Mm. And people are generally unwilling to actually really consider a lot of the ideological points thoroughly. You know, I think with a lot of these 
topics, you know, decentralization, anonymity, sending money outside of the bounds of the government, you really do have to engage with those really carefully and think about like, okay, so what are the risks when we're doing this? How are we putting our users at risk? You know, how are people going to lose privacy, for example? People just sort of, they, they just look at it and they go, oh, decentralization, that sounds great. And they don't think about, you know, some of the, the potential downsides or trade-offs that they're making. And so, yeah, it's, it's just a weird, the, the space has evolved in a really weird and, and unsettling way. And uh, there's plenty of examples of uh, every time some of these venture capitalists like you're talking about create like a crypto project, right? They're trying to sell you and they have the ideas decent. But it's like, they don't even like make any half ass attempt at even technologically implementing decentralization. What they're doing is they're making central APIs or something, right? They're making right. these exchanges that are basically just banks anyway. So all this talk about, oh, with the bank list and all that stuff is like, well, you're, you're not really any different. Um, and, and then again, like they just, one example after another just keeps just undermining your entire, uh, for example, MetaMask sending money back and forth from Venezuela and stuff like that, or OpenSea kicking um, uh, Iranian artists off their platform is like, dude, this is a central platform. Like you just, it, 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 this is a charade. It's a big fraud, right? You know, decentralized nothing. Yeah, and I mean, if you, it's it, it's really weird, and I don't know why more people don't object to this, but like to hear the Andreessen Horowitzes and the various other venture capitalists talk about crypto, they're basically condemning themselves. You know, they'll they'll say all these things about like we don't want to have a web that's controlled by a couple of big companies, and it's like, who did you invest in? Mm. Like, look at Andreessen Horowitz. They were, like, backing all of these tech monopolies. Andreessen Horowitz has so much control in the tech industry. And so it's like, why are you claiming that you're trying to take power away from yourselves? Mm -hmm. You know, no one, no one should be believing that. No one should be looking at them and thinking, oh, yeah, you know, now, after they've created this, you know, tech monopoly horror show, they've suddenly seen the light and they want to return power to the little guy and, like, you know, return wealth to the little guy. Why wouldn't you just think that they're trying to centralize power and centralize and, and hoard as much money as they can for themselves when that's what they've been doing for years? I mean, they're mm -hmm. a venture capital firm. That's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. Um, and it's really weird to see people looking at, you know, people at those venture capital firms as though they are these visionaries in the crypto industry who yes. espouse all these ideals when they're just regurgitating talking points that they clearly don't believe. Mm hmm yeah, that's kind of like our experience at the Bitcoin conference too. Like, it just really looked more like a corporate sideshow. Like, let's be clear the the industry bought in. It's been mainstreamified. Like, even like the handful of people we talked to, they're actually kind of cool and not into that whole thing. They're all like, "Yeah, this isn't at all like what we thought is going to be like. This is just some corporate sideshow." And um, I want to hone in on what you had just said about the whole hoarding power and wealth thing, and in general, crypto and how does it actually compare to like the traditional economy in in the distribution of wealth and power like um like i i know equality was never really one of the initial promises of crypto like they promised us anonymity and decentralization but it just seems like inequality has kind of always just been baked into the whole formula in the first place right i guess my question is like how, who who's owning all the bitcoins like how is this pyramid set up and i i think i remember reading something along the lines of like two percent of all the addresses hold 95 percent of the bitcoins but i, I don't know like Maybe you could clue us in, like, who, who's got all the, the Bitcoins? Yeah, it's it's worse than traditional finance. You know, you talk about, you know, the, the 1% in the U.S., uh, you know, holding so much of the wealth. But if you look at the distribution of Bitcoins, it's like the 0.01%. It's, it's worse than the, uh, you know, traditional monetary system. And if you look at the way that a lot of the cryptocurrencies, aside from Bitcoin, are designed... They're designed with the intention of having, I mean, they all, not all, but a lot of them have these huge pre-mines where before the general public can go and buy this token, they set aside this huge portion of it, either for the founding team or often for the investors in the company. And so it's like the general public starts at a disadvantage. And we see this same pattern happen again and again with these where people will hoard those pre-mined coins that the general public didn't have access to. And then when the project opens up the token for general access and retail investors are all excited and they see this new project and it's really interesting, they buy up the token. And that's when the people who had this early access dump all their tokens and make a killing. 
uh, at the expense of the retail investors because after they dump their tokens, the price goes back down and those retail investors are often the ones who bought high and then end up you know, having to sell low or not even being able to sell the tokens at all. So it's almost like it's designed to benefit the people who have early access, which is wealthy people, people with influence, people who are connected and not, you know, the little guy, even though a lot of crypto projects have also started to claim that they are focused on empowering people who don't have access to traditional finance, Mm -hmm. to banking the unbanked, you know, to, to distributing wealth outside of the, you know, hands of these tech founders that they're, you know, demonizing while basically becoming one themselves. So it's, it's, it's definitely a, a pretty unequal world. You know, there are these mm-hmm. crypto whales that have obscene amounts of money. And, and then there's most, you know, the average person who's not usually doing very well. Hmm. Actually, I want to ask you about, uh, you had said like some of these folks who are trying to use crypto as a means to kind of distribute power, you get on the Galtern way. And, uh, also, there has been a number of attempts within crypto to kind of carve out a space for uh, marginalized groups, women, people of color, you know what I'm saying, queer folks. And uh, I just wonder how that actually fits like within the larger sphere, which I don't know, I, I kind of see as toxic, right? Like how do you, is it seems like a contradiction or a juxtaposition, but I was wondering like if you had any opinion on how, how those have actually fared, like have they um, made any waves in, in their claims? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of typical of frauds where you know, if you're, if you're doing a Ponzi scheme or something like that, you know, just traditional money, no crypto involved. One good way of getting people to buy into your fraud is to say like, Hey, I'm just like you, you know, we have the same circumstances, you know, we're all queer, we're all women or whatever. Come, you know, get in on this, you know, get your friends in on this, tell everyone how great this is. And we're all going to lift each other up together. I mean, like people have been using that language for far longer than crypto has been around, but it has very much become a part of the crypto industry where there are these sort of affinity frauds and predatory schemes that really do target individual communities based on some attribute. We saw a lot of it with NFTs and women, you know, it's like, hey, you know, you know, we have been excluded from the crypto industry. It's this total like crypto bro space, but come here, like, we'll welcome you right in. We'll show you which NFTs to buy. You can make money too. And then it's like, you know, women come in, they buy the NFT, and then they end up getting basically taken for a ride. You know, it's it's sort of a, a predatory scheme, I think, mm. where, you know, the, the goal is to get people to buy in, not to actually, you know, make sure that the outcomes are fair to them. Mm. And I think the data has begun to back that up. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those things that's a little bit hard to measure, but there were some studies around like who has been buying cryptocurrencies and it showed that black Americans were among one of the larger uh, groups that was buying in compared to their white counterparts or to other groups. And then there was recently a study published that showed that a lot of the people, you know, the, the same people who bought into crypto, you know, the black Americans who bought in bought when the prices were high Mm. and then either had to sell or chose to sell after you know the most recent crypto crash and so it's like sure they were buying crypto they were getting into crypto and the crypto companies were all talking this up like look we're you know we're providing this option you know marginalized people are using our products and then turns out that likely they were losing a lot of money based on you know the times at which they purchased and sold so you know i think people just have to realize that like you know you can't say like across the board that you know, we're welcoming in these marginalized communities and it's going to be good for them because if you're welcoming in marginalized communities to something that is detrimental to them, you know, that's not a good thing. You, you need to be really thoughtful about, you know, who you're targeting and what your goals are. And, and in crypto, so the goal is usually just to make a lot of money. Yeah, right. That seems like it's all real use cases, uh, speculation, financial casino type of thing it's uh the negative sum game mostly losers right like you had said the early adapters made bank and then they tried to pass the bag onto somebody else when it got bad and unfortunately look who suffered the most i want to ask about other implementations of this whole crypto DAO thing that is not specifically speculation or money you know there's a lot of these um DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations uh, a lot of them are branding themselves as social impact DAOs, right like ukraine DAO is one of the big ones 
There's a couple environmental justice related ones. I was wondering if what your experience is that. And I, I don't know. I just kind of think that. Sorry, I got a cat there. I just kind of think the DAO is kind of a cool idea. It sounds cool. I'm an anarchist, right? Decentralized, <laughs> autonomous organization. Wow, is this like? But I don't know if you had any opinion on. I know everyone's different. If you think that that is somehow different than some of the regular speculation type of hyper financialization of the project. Yeah, so I had kind of a similar experience to you when I heard about these DAOs, and I was like, oh, cool, you know, like online self-governing communities, that sounds awesome, you know, it's, um, you know, as opposed to like social media, for example, where the rules are set by the, you know, the tech company or, or whoever, and there's these, you know, outside moderation teams, and the users have very little input into how things are run or how decisions are made, you know, I was like, oh, that sounds pretty great. But like a lot of things in crypto, you know, the promise sounds good and the actual reality is not living up to the promise. So, you know, if you look at these DAOs, a lot of them, first of all, are DAOs in name only. You know, they're not decentralized. They're not autonomous. They're just a group of people who like crypto who are coming together and they call themselves a DAO, even though they haven't implemented any actual governance uh, system. That's strikingly common in, in the DAO space where it's like, it's not a DAO. It's just a group of people. And there's still just one person who makes all the decisions. But among the DAOs that do actually have a governance system set up, you have to look at how power is being distributed in those groups. So in most cases with DAOs, the way that they operate is people get votes based on how many tokens they hold. So a DAO has a governance token, you obtain some amount of those governance tokens. And then, you know, if you have 10 tokens, you get 10 votes. If you have one token, you only get one vote. And this is implemented because there's a lot of trouble in crypto around something called the Sybil problem, which if you're not familiar is basically, you know, if, if you did one vote per crypto wallet, there's nothing that would stop me from just making a hundred crypto wallets and voting a hundred times because, you know, in crypto, you don't necessarily know who somebody is. It's just a wallet address. And there's really very limited options in terms of preventing people from uh, gaming the system that way. It's like this huge unsolved problem in crypto. And so they sort of have to go with this token-based voting system. But when you set up voting based on how many tokens you hold, then it just means the rich people in this DAO get all the votes and it's often the founders or a, you know, a, a founding team. And you end up with the same, if not worse, centralization of power with DAOs than in a lot of even traditional systems, which might have, you know, shareholder voting or something like that. So I think DAOs have sort of adopted, again, the language of flat organizations where everyone gets a vote and then you actually look at how they're being run and it's, you know, it's a plutocracy basically. Yeah, wow, this whole uh, voting based on how many tokens you have seems like, for one, I don't know why you need to have on-chain voting in the first place, right? I mean, like, <laughs> like why can't, isn't there other ways of uh, organizing? And anyways, like you had said, too, the financialization of it, like the whales have disproportionate power, it seems, right? Like the of buying of votes type of thing, right? Crypto's right. not got around that problem. It, that would arguably be even worse than what we have in traditional organizations, you know what I'm saying, with voting powers and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I've done some research in terms of like, okay, so, you know, how could we get around that problem? How could we set up alternative voting structures for these DAOs? And you start to see people exploring self-sovereign identity solutions where the idea is like, okay, so we want people to be able to prove that they only have one wallet in this DAO, but we don't necessarily want them to have to reveal who they are because, you know, it's crypto and everyone should be anonymous. And the systems that people are coming up with to allow for that kind of thing are like black mirror dystopian nightmare type of stuff where it's like, you know, I mean, like a good example of this is a system called WorldCoin where they decided that they wanted to, they claim that they want to provide universal basic income but it looks kind of like they want to just train, you know, a big system to uh, scan people's eyeballs. And they have these like chrome orbs that kind of collect biometric data on people and retinal scans. And the idea is that like your retinal scan is unique. And so we can like hash it and make sure that you only have one crypto wallet. And it's like, you're scanning people's eyeballs and you're like storing that data in some system that you're not telling people about. They're collecting all kinds of other biometric data. It's like, it's horrifying. 
Mm. And there, there are other systems that people have suggested around like web of trust where you verify that your friend is a real person and then they can verify that their friends are real people. And aside from being probably pretty impractical because in order for that to work, you need every single person to participate. They're also really kind of weird around like, okay, now you can challenge that someone's a real person or you can like attest that someone is not a real person. And it's like, boy, that sounds like a dystopian novel that hasn't been written yet. (laughs) That's been a regular theme of this whole crypto thing, right? This dystopian nightmare, it seems. Yeah. 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 Copying your biometrics to some type of public ledger. Yeah. I can't see any situation where that would go wrong. Like, yeah, what could possibly go wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, or scanning your IDs. Yeah, it's like, I thought it was supposed to be, you know, now you want my ID scanned to the blockchain. All right. um, it's actually something that um, Vitalik Buterin has talked about. He's the guy, you know, who's behind a lot of the Ethereum community. He's like this absolute god among people who like Ethereum. He started talking about these things called soulbound tokens, which, first of all, is a terrifying name. Um <laughs> But, you know, he was coming up with this idea that, you know, you could use these soul bound tokens that can't be transferred to determine if somebody is worth engaging with, basically. Like he was talking about how, you know, right now you can't necessarily decide if you trust someone enough to give them a loan that isn't over collateralized because you have no information about them. There is no incentive for them to not just run off with that money. But you could use these soul bound tokens that showed you know, this sort of picture of their identity to determine some level of trustworthiness without necessarily exposing their identity. And so he started talking about this on some podcast. He, he wrote a whole white paper about it, which was like pretty weird uh, and, and gave me some concerns to begin with. And then I saw that he was on this podcast. And so I was like, oh, I'll go listen to what he has to say about it. And he started talking about how you could use these soul bound tokens for like negative credentials, basically, because if you're given one of these tokens and you can't get rid of it, then it can be used to prove things about you, even if you don't necessarily want them proven about you. And his example was, if you want to try to determine someone's level of trustworthiness, well, we could just put all police records on the blockchain, oh and then you God. could basically query someone's you know, wallet and see, do they have a police record? And I was like, are you crazy? Like, wow. you want to put all police records on the blockchain in a format that they cannot be challenged or erased? Like, in what universe is that not going to be abused and used to absolutely exclude the most marginalized people from the system that you're claiming is going to be revolutionary as far as inclusion goes. So it's, I mean, I think a lot of people just don't think about these things. It's people like Vitalik Buterin who have no experience with marginalized communities or with, you know, police, um, you know, abuse. And they just think of these things and they're like, boy, that sounds great. And they want to move forward with it. And no one tells them no. Wow. Yeah, that got carceral really quickly. Like, I mean, yeah. Yeah. What, what happened to the whole off the grid, right? Underground economy, right? Now it's all like we will build a nightmare uh, credit score system that you can't opt out of. Like, wow. And this is a main Ethereum guy, too. Right? Turns into like these crazy social credit projects, like in the blink of an eye. Um, going back to the DAO thing, like, why do you need a DAO anyways? Why do you need on-chain voting? Like, I mean, having... There's plenty of other examples of decentralized organization. I'm just going to just look at the anarchist side of things. We got, you know, we got like Funat Bombs. We got Antifa. We got Books to Prisoners, Anarchist Black Cross. Remember Indie Media a long time ago? That was decentralized uh, journalists. Uh, John Brown Gun Clubs everywhere. Occupy Wall Street was uh, decentralized. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of different implementations of consensus, decision making, spokes, councils, de- diversity of tactics. So why do you need a blockchain? And um, I want to ask you. Because Wikipedia has been doing this for the longest, right? Like, <laughs> that's a great like uh, method yeah. of content moderation or self organization that didn't need a blockchain, right? Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, I think a part of it is there's this there's like this impulse in the tech industry where people will think of something like a DAO and they'll go, "We're brilliant. No one has ever thought of this before." We were the first people to ever think about a group where you could all come together and like run the group together. And they just don't look at history, you know, or they don't look at systems outside of their little bubble. And so they, it's like they just don't know that co-ops or mutual organizations or, you know, various other forms of this have existed for centuries. 
And especially, I think, when people are, a lot of people in the crypto industry are coming from a very capitalist system. You know, they've worked in tech, for example, for a long time. You know, they, they don't have exposure to, like, mutual aid organizations that might be structured in this way. They just aren't aware that these opportunities are available. Um, I mean, I think it, a lot of it is just naivety where people are just like, yeah, we're brilliant. We've come up with the first self-governing system and they don't realize that, again, this is something that has existed. But I also think that people are in crypto are very keen on basically trying to create technological solutions for things that are actually really a societal problem. So if you look at, you know, any self-governing community, there's a lot of issues there that come up. You know, people get into fights. There's disputes about how the community should be run, who should ultimately be able to make a decision if there's disagreement. You know, there's there's a lot of messy human parts to organizations like that that are challenging. I mean, it's, it's tough, especially with large organizations, um, to you know, make sure everyone is on the same page and, and is, you know, uh, working towards the same goals. And so I think there's this impulse to say, well, we'll just fix it with code. And so, you know, we don't have to get into those messy arguments. We'll just set it up with token voting. And if you don't like it too bad, you know, it'll all just be, you know, code is law, basically. It'll all just be self-running systems that, and you don't have to get worried about all the messy human stuff. Which is just, I think, really naive. You know, the messy human stuff is is the important part. These organizations, I think, require the messy human part to actually function well. And by trying to take that out of the picture, you just sort of ignore the real issues that you need to be engaging with. And so you end up with these sort of these DAOs where people are just like trying to gain the system and they're trying to buy votes, you know, because again, the messy human part will find its way in no matter how you set it up. It just sort of appears in different ways. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's just a lot of naivety in crypto around these types of communities. And there's a lot of ignorance towards the fact that when you introduce a token that has some monetary value, you also introduce a sort of competing incentive. So that's something I've seen a fair bit with these social impact DAOs, like you mentioned, where, you know, the DAO has some goal, whatever it might be, you know, saving the rainforests. And people are using their governance tokens to vote on proposals or whatever. You know, they're using them as voting tokens in the pursuit of that goal. But because the tokens have a monetary value to them, because they need to, to prevent someone from totally gaming the system, there's now this competing goal that is not necessarily aligned with the goal of the DAO, which is that they want to maximize the value of the token because then individual members of the DAO could sell off their token for loads of money. And that's, you know, really exciting to a lot of people. And so now you have these, you know, save the rainforest DAOs that are also coming up with these crazy schemes to try to come up, you know, to maximize the price of their token. And often those goals are completely disaligned. And so you end up with a, a group that just sort of collapses because it ends up pulling apart in those two different directions. So we're talking about the future of these crypto and DAO scenes. Do you think that uh, there is one for one? And also, do you think that maybe it's just we just need less fully automated luxury capitalists and maybe some more fully automated luxury communists? Um, I mean, I don't have much hope for the future of DAOs in their current you know, in in their current form, uh, it seems like the idea, the issue of token-based voting, is pretty intractable, uh, and a lot of the solutions to it, which people are working on, sound worse. There's some magical self-sovereign identity solution out there that is actually, you know, wonderful and will solve everything, but I kind of doubt it. You know, it, it seems like we just end up with these really scary and weird social credit systems or you know, biometric systems. So I do think that I don't, one thing that's I think really important though is, is to separate the impugnment of DAOs and, and my skepticism of DAOs 
from my feelings around self-governing communities, because I'm very optimistic about the future of mutual aid organizations that are set up in, you know, fairly flat structures or online self-governing communities like Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. I think they're, those can be enormously powerful. You know, co-ops are another good example. They can be enormously powerful and effective. It's, you know, I think it's just the idea that they somehow need crypto in mm -hmm. order to function um, that is not true. And, and in some cases, I think sometimes kind of arrogant people who are like, we could fix all the problems with Wikipedia if we just, you know, if you just put a crypto token in there. And it's always people who have no idea how Wikipedia works who suggest that. You know, they just have this idea of crypto as like the one big savior for all these organizations. So, yeah, I mean, long story short, I think that there is not that much potential in DAOs in their current form. But I do hope, maybe naively, maybe, maybe it's unlikely, that people who are exposed to communities that are just like working together in the pursuit of a common goal via this crypto world start to explore the world of you know self organizing organizing communities outside of crypto you know maybe the best case scenario here will be that all these people who got into DAOs because they wanted to speculate on some DAO token actually realize that like hey maybe there's something to this <clears throat> organizational structure you know, that doesn't just have this one big boss. Maybe we should try this without the token that kept getting gamed. Uh, and they'll start to explore other forms of governance like that. Right. Yeah, because, I mean, there are a lot of well-meaning people, I would say, uh, who I met that maybe are in it for the right reasons, uh, but they just attach to this whole crypto industry thing that just just delegitimizes everything that, that they've been working for. But how do you unplug people from this? I mean, that's seems like failure after failure after failure like what's the line for a lot of people like when they just say man that's enough like um because it seems like we just need to get people out of this this ecosystem and into stuff that's like meaningful and that's why i really like some of the work that you do um i don't have much hope and faith for like these regulators or or these crypto people to just willingly give up power someone needs to go out there and study it like yourself and point it out and uh because every time you do that it's like hopefully like driving a wedge in such a way that people are just kind of opening their eyes to this whole thing. Uh, so I guess my question is, how do you unplug people? And also, how bad is it going to get first? Like, I mean, what's rock bottom here? Yeah, I mean, so I think that, I think you're completely right that, you know, there is potential for some of these people who are involved to realize that like, okay, so crypto maybe isn't the way to achieve the goals that I've been chasing and they they're often very reasonable goals i mean like banking the unbanked sounds great right like that's that's something we should be working on we should be fixing financial access and you know maybe those people will realize that like okay so crypto is clearly not working well but what might work well you know maybe we can start to work in that direction and i think that you know i mean i hope that the work that i'm doing is is helping with that you know helping people realize that the system that they have chosen has these enormous flaws that are preventing it from achieving the goals that they are ostensibly chasing after. Um, you know, I've heard from some people who've seen some of the work that I've done and who said, you know, I was all in on crypto and I decided, you know, to, to leave the industry, to sell all my tokens, whatever it is, uh, because of, you know, some other things that you said, which is... I mean, that's been really satisfying for me. I hope that there are more people out there who are seeing the kinds of work that I'm doing and a lot of other people are doing and, and really reconsidering their, their choice is as far as engaging with crypto. But ultimately, and I mean, cynically, I do think that these crypto crashes also have some of that effect as well, where, you know, the price goes down, people who bought into Bitcoin when it was $50,000 a coin are now realizing that that was maybe not the right decision for them. They get disillusioned and they leave the industry. Um, I think that's probably more likely why larger numbers of people are leaving. You know, the promises that they were made around this being the secret to generational wealth and to, you know, all of these amazing returns turned out to be false. And so they feel slighted basically by crypto and they choose to leave for that reason. So uh, this whole cyberpunk future with, with neon lights and uh, you can pay for McDonald's with bitcoins and uh, is, is it going to be like that or is it going to be like some dystopia where we're like forced into some world of Warcraft to like mine for gold 
in some dystopia, right? <laughs> like, like Elon Musk and all that shit running shit. Like, um, part of me just wants to be like, man, burn this shit to the ground. I mean, like this whole, oh, spread Bitcoin all over the world, like is just more of the same. Capitalism is great and it'll set people free all over the world. We need to spread democracy and it's just some Western like financialization thing. And it just seems like in the examples, it has failed, right? Like look what it did to El Salvador. I guess just to wrap this whole conversation up, Molly, um, I want to know what you think the end stage is going to look like, right? I mean, even right now, kind of just looking at crypto and NFTs is, to me, it seems like kind of like a crude parody of capitalism, right? Like this is what the end of the world is going to look like. But how, how bad is it going to get? Like, uh, and before I answer that question, I want to ask you, like, what are some of the most ridiculous, just bedonkest fucking examples of these NFT projects and crypto projects uh, that you've seen? Like, because there's some pretty off the wall ones, uh, just like Pringles NFTs and just like stuff like that. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like you could taste. Yeah. Ta yeah, right. Um, so I guess to the first question, I mean, I think it will depend a lot on to the, you know, the extent to which people have to engage with crypto. So I think the one saving grace of crypto to date is that people largely can opt out of it. You know, like you don't have to hold any crypto. There's no reason for you to actually like need to engage with a blockchain on a day to day basis. And so, you know, people can just avoid it. I think the true dystopian nightmare will be if people actually are basically required to engage with it in some way, whether it's, you know, actually required or, you know, you can't work someplace unless you're willing to accept your payments in crypto or, you know, you need this NFT to go to this, t you know, band that you want to go see because they only do NFT tickets now. And, you know, the sort of like seeping, uh, you know, tendrils of crypto, you know, becoming something that you can't avoid. Um, but, you know, I think there's, <laughs> there's a lot to, uh, worry about as far as that goes, you know, we've been seeing crypto becoming more closely tied to the traditional financial system to the point where people are now starting to worry about contagion to traditional finance, which to date, luckily has been fairly limited, you know, <clears throat> when FTX fell apart, it didn't have a huge impact on traditional finance. Um, but you know, they sh they were certainly hoping to be very closely tied to traditional finance. I mean, FTX had bought a bank, you know, a traditional bank. Um, and we're starting to see more traditional financial institutions engage with crypto. I mean, Fidelity, which is like a major retirement plan uh, offer. You know, I used to have a retirement plan with Fidelity and they've started advertising crypto to everybody. Um, some pension plans are starting to put money into crypto. So, you know, I think that's the really scary thing is, is where it's being really welcomed into a world that people can't really opt out of. Um, to go to the more fun question, I guess, around <laughs> these crazy crypto projects. I mean, people are, will do the weirdest things with crypto. I think a huge one is around these, um, crypto paradise projects that people are starting to come up with where it's like you buy our token and you can come live on our islands where we live and breathe crypto all day. I mean, you went to the Bitcoin Miami conference and you can probably imagine what it would be like being stuck on an island with some of those people. Like that just sounds like the worst possible scenario, especially when people, they come up with these plans for it and all of their plans involve like, oh, this is what the big casino is going to look like. And this is, you know, what the... Uh, Lambos that drive you around the island are going to look like and there's like no thought that's been put into like waste management or like electricity for all these Bitcoin miners that they're going to try to put on the island. And so it's just like kind of funny to imagine this like fire festival of crypto bros that they're sort of trying to put together. Um, fire festival. So that's definitely been a favorite of mine is is that. I also really love crypto projects where they seem to be under the impression that because they're using cryptocurrency, the just like normal rules don't apply for some reason. So like the best example of that, I think, is the Dune project where these guys decided that they wanted to buy the storyboard for the Dune film that was like lost or whatever. What? And so they they raised like an exorbitant amount of money to go buy at auction this Dune storyboard. And their whole plan was like, okay, and then once we have this, we can create all of this um, 
media based on it. They wanted to make some sort of like animated show based on this storyboard. And people had to point out to them that like, just because you bought a book doesn't mean that you own the copyright to that book and you don't own the IP. Like, it's like they think if you go to a bookstore and you buy a copy of some novel, you can just now make a movie about that same novel because you like own a physical copy. And I was like, what world do you live in where that's how that works, you know? Um, so those are kind of my favorite ones where it's like people just sort of get so wrapped up in the, you know, mythology around crypto that they just sort of forget about reality. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. The fanaticism. Uh, hey, how about yeah. the uh, Frida Kahlo burning that one up, manifested into the, <laughs> you that was ridiculous. Yeah, we still, luckily we still don't know if it was actually a Frida Kahlo drawing or if it was a counterfeit. Um, my hope is that my, the most poetic thing would be that the guy thought he was buying a real Frida Kahlo drawing and he actually got scammed by somebody who sold him a fake drawing. That's what I'm really hoping happened, Yeah. but who knows? <laughs> Then there was also that ridiculous monument tribute to Elon Musk that cost like more than half a million dollars. Like, yeah, it was like six hundred thousand dollars to make this rocket with Elon on it. I that? love that. Oh yeah, yeah, that shit was ridiculous. You know the whole clout hero worship of uh, these rich billionaires, though. Well, and the, the betrayal when he didn't accept their gift. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Well, it's not the first time Musk uh, didn't piss off a bunch of Dogecoin people when he got everybody hopped up on that. And then um, his yeah. company bought Bitcoin and then sold all the Bitcoin. And uh, well, it's just like all these other charlatans, I suppose. And to the extent that Bitcoin and crypto is going to continue to represent or work with capitalist economy, uh, we, for one, are looking forward to that economy dying. They say, it's an old like 60s uh, French quote from the Situationist, right? It was like there's graffiti on the walls. It was like, the economy is wounded. I hope it dies, right? So we're, we're enjoying watching the dumpster fires and your coverage of this. It is a terrible atrocity, but um, Molly, thank you for coming on and entertaining us with your immense knowledge of the crypto scene, as disgusting as it is. Thanks for having me. Where can people tune into your work and all that? Just so I know, of course, Web3 is going great. Yep, Web3 is going great.com is the website. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at the moment. <laughs> Who knows how long that will continue? Uh, at Molly0XFFF and my website, mollywhite.net. We're going to continue this conversation, though, in a second, though, with uh, Cooper. So anyways, we're back. We still have our esteemed guests. We have Cooper Quinton from the EFF. We have Molly White from uh, Web3 is going great. Um, this next little is a kind of a panel conversation. You know, we're all coders, old school hackers, technologists, if you will. And we want to just kind of just throw some questions out there and get your opinions on the state of the world. A hell of a timeline, right? Are we headed to some fully automated luxury gay space communism? You know, the techno dream, the anarchist utopia, or is all this really leading us to some dystopian crypto fascist hell and what role do technologists and coders what role do we play in building this utopia or dystopia and what do we got to do about it so uh, the main thing i guess uh the question is whether technology is neutral like and on its own maybe get any of y'all opinions cooper why don't you go first just throw it out there cooper yeah i mean uh technology is absolutely not neutral right like every Every decision we make as technologists, whether you're at Google, whether you're at Wikipedia or Apple or whatever, or EFF, uh, all of these decisions are not neutral, right? The decision to invest in cryptocurrencies is not neutral, right? Um, and and right now, I'd say we're pretty solidly headed toward you know a, a crypto fascist technological nightmare future, you know, cyberpunk, but without any of the cool aesthetics. 
um, just the most boring example of cyberpunk you could possibly imagine, right? Uh, with with like instead of instead of cool mega corporations ran by weird ancient dudes, you have Elon Musk just just having a mental breakdown in real time and being the most incredibly divorced dude of all time. Um, it's it's I do like I am still at my heart, a techno utopian. Like I still do want that fully automated luxury gay space communism, uh, space anarchism, not <laughs> communism, not a tanky. All right. Um, but like, I, I still do want that in my heart and I still do believe that we can get there. Um, but I think that there was, because of a lot of really naive libertarians in the, in the origin of this movement who thought that capitalism could coexist with a like actual free and open uh and and liberationist internet were very wrong and i think that partly because of those people is why we've ended up here yeah I, I agree with pretty much everything you just said i mean it feels like we are hurtling towards the most obscene form of capitalism that can possibly exist and, uh, you know, that is very dystopian, you know, the, the, I mean, we're just seeing it in real time, basically, as, as some of these uh, projects are, you know, conceived. But I also, I guess, remain hopeful, if not optimistic about uh, the future and, you know, what technology could bring. I think there needs to be an enormous shift in how things are operated today. I mean, the the system of, you know, these huge tech companies that are basically monopolizing the web uh, and, you know, <laughs> pushing crypto coins on us increasingly uh, is, is clearly not working very well. And to some extent, I wonder if crypto is almost going to, not to go like full accelerationist here, but like, it feels like crypto is really like almost exposing some of the most extreme flaws in the capitalist structure that has come to become so dominant and so to some extent i almost wonder if it is going to like hasten the collapse um but you know who knows i i, I do dream that you know even if the whole thing doesn't fall apart people start to see the sort of disgusting impact of a lot of this technology and and the, these billionaires who are really sort of driving the ship and they start to think about alternative ways of doing things and you know their own you know when, when it comes to technologists i hope they start to think about their own role that they're playing in it you know and, and their complacency or support of these structures that have become so dominant you know i think that there is an ethical responsibility for people who are working in tech to really think deeply about what they're building and why they're building it who they're building it for, who is being disadvantaged by it. Um, and I really hope that those, you know, ethical questions start to become a very prominent part of people's, you know, decision making. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I, like one last thing I want to add that you made me think of, Molly, is just that, like, I think, you know, one of the things I say a lot is that, like, hackers and technologists and and cryptographers and people understand this space actually have a lot of power right like we have a ton of power in in society right and now an outsized amount frankly way more than we should but like i i've i've always been a big fan of spider-man uh and even though he's a cop and like you know i think we need to remember that with great power comes great responsibility right like the things you do really do affect a ton of people and you need to Keep that in mind and think about like all of the effects that you're going to have and think like, you know, do I want to write code for this robot that's going to be used to kill somebody at some point? Right. Or like, do I want my code to kill people? Do I want my code to make people richer? Right. Or do I want my code to like actually materially make people's lives better who need those improvements in their lives, who are having the hardest time? Right. And I, I would argue that every technologist should be, going for that third option. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree with what y'all said. Um, it seems like we do have a collective responsibility as technologists uh, for the work that we do. You ever go to like classes for InfoSec classes and it's the same thing for like people going to law school too. And, and it's like, you might be sitting there thinking that you're gonna work as a coder for do some cool things, meaningful projects to contribute. But the person next to you is you're like, I wanna work for the NSA. And, uh, or, the, or the person at law school would be like, yeah, I think I'll be a prosecutor. 
you know, like I think I'll go work for the police, right? Um, and it's like people who worked yeah, up in these be a corporate attorney suing people for IP violations and <laughs> yeah, right. And I really making making sure that Monsanto stays on top, right? Or if you're like the ones coding these mass surveillance systems or or coding these robot kill dogs and stuff like that. Right? Uh, I feel like if you work up in a messed up industry, military contractors or the police or even crypto, really, you should you should uh, really have to clarify that like that. Oh, uh, you should stipulate that. Oh, just so you know, I work in crypto. Right. Or I'm apartheid emerald rich. You know, what I mean, uh, type of thing. <laughs> and I guess uh, at this point, it seems like we're, we're speeding towards a cliff and um to me, it seems like we spent a lot of time building the system, right? And now we need to spend more time breaking it. And we need to break the system. And like you said, Cooper, like uh, a lot of us have disproportionate power. A lot of people who might join the force thinking, you know, they're at the NSA now or they're working at Meta or something like that. And then they look at like well, all that's going on in the world. And um, they see, for example, mass layoffs at Meta, Amazon, Twitter, Foxconn workers in China uh, striking, just going ham against the police, right? And it's like, it's a whose side are you on type of moment, right? When Musk just severs the union contract, all the janitors and kicks them in the street right before the holidays is like, which side are you on, right? And for those who do find themselves working in this industry, I want to say like you are in a unique position to know where to put the in the gears. You know what I'm saying? Like we need more Edward Snowden's, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Like you can do good inside of a large company because you know where the horrible things are like you have a view that those of us who are outside of that like like me and molly don't have right like if you're in google you you can be in a position to help a lot of people but you're still fighting against that horrible fucking corporate machinery do the good you can do all the good you can right and leave a spanner in the works on the way out <laughs> i was just gonna say like i think also if you if you've decided to work for a corporation like that you also have to be really clear about like your you know your line like how far is too far at what point are you unwilling to be a part of a company like that for a lot of people you know some companies have already crossed that line and they are unwilling to work for them and i think that you know every technologist needs to know exactly what they're willing to be a part of you know one thing that i think is if, if there is any good that has come out of Elon Musk and his crazy nightmare dictatorship of Twitter, it's that he's sort of, I think, holding a spotlight to some of the practices of some of these really powerful people who are just abusing employees in these tech companies. And so my hope is that, you know, some of the unionization that we've been seeing, especially in the past two years or so in the tech industry will continue to move forward because... I think that there are opportunities to really highlight the power that, you know, collective organizing has against some of these absolute nightmare <laughs> bosses, basically. So, like, you know, if you are working for a company like Google or Twitter at this point, like, maybe start talking to your coworkers about a union. You know, you are, you know, if you're still at Twitter, despite Elon Musk's iron fist, you know, what's to protect you from being the next in line when he decides that you've done something wrong or you aren't important, you know, it's time to start protecting yourself. Absolutely. I'll, so EFF actually unionized uh, last year and the management uh, voluntarily accepted our union and we're currently in the process of negotiating our contract, but like, yeah, it, I mean, it already feels amazing, right? And like, and I, I love my job at EFF. And a lot of tech workers would say like, well, I love my job. It's really comfortable. Like, what's the, what's the point of unionizing? Like, I can just go to my boss right now and we can have a friendly chat if I need something. And like, you, you might not always be able to do that. At some point, your company is going to do something you disagree with. And at some point, at, at, well, at all points, companies are ultimately a hierarchical structure. And at some point, you're going to get told, no, we don't give a shit about you. You are a cog in the machine. You are replaceable. And fuck you. And you need to unionize right now, even if you like your job, especially if you like your job, because you got to take that power to, to keep it that way and to take that power with your coworkers to protect each other. Um, so, yeah, huge plus one to what Molly said. Go Hell yeah. unionize your workplace. I'll say I think you're totally right about Elon Musk, and I think the other good thing about Elon Musk playing Twitter is that he's shown a spotlight on how fucking stupid billionaires actually are, <laughs> yes. and just like how like like 
they are not geniuses. They're not smart. They are just people who happen to get a shitload of money. And like, they are just as stupid as the rest of us, a whole hell of a lot more narcissistic than most of us. And hopefully he has done some serious damage to the cult of the billionaire. Uh, those, uh, th- those dudes who, but you said $500 million to buy a rocket? Or Six, was it $500,000? No, it was six hundred. It was $600,000. Yeah. <laughs> they spent half a million dollars trying to dick ride Elon Musk. That's amazing. Almost literally. It is sort of a weird, like, Freudian shaped weird... <laughs> monument. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if they did that before or after he tweeted about Cum Rocket. Mm, that's a good question. <laughs> the world's only cum themed cryptocurrency. Probably not. No, I'm sure not. <laughs> In fact, I can think of two off the top of my head right now. <laughs> I hate it all. <laughs> yeah, so uh, these billionaire assholes, they're just walking all over us, right? They need us, but we don't need them. And it almost seems like the collective organization that this is so needed right now to defend workers' rights against these billionaires uh, is almost like the antithesis of the uh, hyper-individualistic, quote-unquote, libertarian, crypto-capitalist uh, ideology, you know what I'm saying, of winners and losers. Like, whereas what we're talking about is kind of more of a collective responsibility and a collective organization that re- rewards people fairly for the work that they do, and instead of just allowing these parasites to profit and just dictate to the world, like, oh, I'm just going to buy Twitter and just fucking platform all these neo-fascists and just because what you're saying cooper about billionaires being kind of like the complete ineptness because uh he's trying to make a point about free speech absolutism but you can see what he's doing with it he's platforming fascists he's de-platforming anti-fascists um, yeah they kick crime think off fuck out of here man like well you kick a lot yeah. of uh, journalists uh, a loader a bunch of other anti-fascists yeah and bringing back all these like literal nazis and stuff like that all the QAnons are back yeah, yeah. But everyone still imagines Trump and Musk to be engaging in some 3D chess game where they know the moves that they're making and you can't understand what they're doing. Right, right. I feel like there's got to be a corollary to the, like, never assume malice when stupidity will suffice, which is also, like, never assume genius when stupidity will suffice. Like, Yeah, and I think it actually sort of comes back around and also to the recent FTX collapse where, like, Sam bankman fried was a billionaire. People thought he was a genius. Turns out he had or he claims he had no idea what was going on. Maybe he was just doing a lot of fraud, who knows? But um, clearly he was not doing enough 5D chess to keep the whole fraud afloat, you know? And it's just another example of like these, you know, billionaires who claim to be uh, incredible what they do, you know, these super geniuses, and then it all just like falls apart because it turns out, you know, he's just not that smart. Yeah. Another fraud like the rest of them. And so like Musk is, yeah. uh, you know, he's known for, People think he's a genius and stuff, but he didn't actually invent any of these technologies. Oh, yeah, he founded, uh, he invented the Tesla. He's like, no, he didn't. He may have been a co-founder with Teal of PayPal, but there's other people at SpaceX who are actually making the rockets fly and not him. He's just the mouthpiece, whatever. Remember when he wanted people to print out all their code? Like, fuck, that. man, you don't even know what you're talking about, man. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's increasingly looking like Elon's companies, as much as they are successful, to the extent that they are successful, are successful in spite of him and not because of him. It seems like there are a lot of people spending a lot of time trying to, like, not upset Elon and to, like, you know, just not let him go, you know, pull the plug on all the Tesla machines or whatever because he thinks it's yeah. a good idea. The, the rumor that I've heard is basically that there's, and it makes sense because we do this in leftist circles too at a smaller scale, is that there's like a team of people that their job is just to be his handlers and like insulate him from the actual workings of the company and like make sure that somebody's doing something that looks cool and technological to him that just like you have like code flashing by on your screen just so that it looks like some weird you know 90s hacker aesthetic right and then he thinks like oh good things are happening here i will move on right Uh, it's just like i've seen on tv (laughs) yeah exactly you know everybody put on your black hoodies elon's coming right (laughs) ah yes this looks great but yeah, you know, we we do this in in a smaller scale on the left too. Like it's just it's just the larger scale, even grittier version of that. Like if Elon is good at anything at all, he's good at like projecting this image of business, right? Like he's good at being a grifter. He's an especially good grifter, and that's all any of these people are is really is like talented grifters. That's all Bill Gates was. That's all Elon Musk is. Trump. BF was. That's all Trump is. Right? They're all just talented grifters. And that's it at the end of the day. The entire economy is just a fucking grift. 
So let's, let's get into this. Who else sucks in the tech scene, right? Like you got all these leaders and stuff like that. Like let's throw some names out there. I'll start with Glenn Greenwald, certified, right? Matt Taibbi, certified. <laughs> Who else? Yeah, I was just going to say, it's weird that there's this like emergent, well, it's not weird. I guess it's kind of expected, but there's sort of been this emergence of like post leftist billionaire bootlickers that have sort of emerged, <laughs> you know, it's like, there's all these people who used to, you know, Glenn Greenwald, Matt Taibbi, who, you know, used to do pretty good work. And like, now they're just out there railing, you know, against the leftists on Twitter and talking about how great Elon Musk is. Like, I was surprised that Elon Musk didn't choose Glenn Greenwald for his Twitter files, yeah. you know, and he had to go with Matt Taibbi instead. But you know, there's this whole list of them that's like they've decided that instead of doing actual meaningful journalism, they're just going to suck up to the billionaires. And it's like, how do you live with yourself? I'm increasingly wondering if Glenn Greenwald is just always a shitty person who happened to get really lucky by getting the Snowden files and just didn't really know what to do with himself after that. Like, I... Well, that's actually kind of my feeling about a lot of tech founders, too. It's like, you know... It's especially with Mark Zuckerberg's recent play with Meta, it's starting to look a lot like he kind of just got really lucky with Facebook. And now he's like, OK, I can do it again. I can do it again. And he's just like right. sort of tilting at the craziest windmills with these like brilliant ideas, you know, that turn out to just be nothing. Trash ass World of Warcraft without legs. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's, his, that's his multi-billion dollar idea. It, yeah, and, and he stole Facebook too, right? Like it's all it's all just grifts all the way down. It's amazing. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It's grifters who got lucky, right? They they're like the dog who caught the truck, right? <laughs> right now, what? Like, yeah. <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> yeah. Which I think actually like comes back around to the point around people working at those companies. It's like, you know, you got to question your loyalty to some of these people. You know, there there are people who are. I mean, Elon Musk is the best example. There are people who are undyingly loyal to Elon Musk, even as he is exposed as a total grifter and a fraud. And it's like, why is that something you're willing to accept? And, you know, why is that the hill you're willing to die on when you could be, you know, actually working for something more meaningful and not just spending all your time, you know, trying to shine up the reputation of a guy who does not care about you? All right. All right. So we know who sucks, right? But kind of flipping it. What are some good projects happening right now? What are some good people who really did stay true to it? For example, never sold out, never gave up. And and what should ethical technologists be doing right now? You are a more song playing in my head now where you're like, never sell out, never give up. Sorry, go on. I know, I know who never sold out. Chelsea Manning never sold out. That's one on our side oh, yeah. that's always been consistently principled. So doing cool things still too. So who else? I mean, I was just going to say, I am personally a huge fan of DDoS Secrets. I feel like they are yes. picking up where WikiLeaks kind of fell apart. Oh, yeah. um, and they are managing to do some really important work while also being really careful about doing it in an ethical way. So that's my big, they, they sort of give me hope for the future of technology, I think. Hell yeah, they do. Big shout out to DDoS yeah, Secrets, by the way. They're awesome as hell. They're they're so so cool, and they're doing such great work. Uh, shout out to an org that I'm actually working with right now called Open Archive. That is building a app and technology to let people videotape. People don't say videotape anymore. I just I just displayed how old I am. With their camcorder. <laughs> <laughs> with their eight millimeter film to let people record like uh, human rights violations or protests or anything else and archive those securely to any number of different backups, like the Internet Archive. I'm on the board of the organization. I think they're doing great work, but they're like they're working with people in Ukraine over the place to try to get footage of human rights abuses and things like that uh, securely archived and out of the country so that journalists can report on this stuff. So I think that's another tech group that is doing cool work. I don't even want to know how many people have approached them and told them they should be using a blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> I keep hearing one of the use cases that keeps coming up is that we need to record human rights abuses to the blockchain. And it's like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I, have no, I have no comment about that. <laughs> Also, Lucy Parsons Labs in Chicago is doing some really amazing stuff. Uh, they, they, back in the day, built a database of all of the employees of the Chicago PD and all of their employee photos by FOIAing the database schema of the, of the Chicago PD like HR database and then FOIAing a SQL query based on that <laughs> database schema to get all their photos and all their names. 
so like yeah huge huge shout out to them they're, they're still doing really cool work hell yeah but did you say foia the sql query because i got thinking it's like why don't you throw some apostrophes or some <laughs> drop tables in there like be funny, right? weaponized yeah. foia requests <laughs> Unfortunately, that's uh, that's easy to uh, trace back, you know. <laughs> but if they ran the code on their own computer, is that a? a I'm not a lawyer, but is, would that be a CFAA violation? I mean, you you ran the, the code yourself, man. I just I just told you to run it. I think there's an XKCD like, uh, comic like I, that. I feel like SBF's lawyers could get you off on a technicality on this. <laughs> also, just to point out real quick, DDoS secrets has been banned from Twitter for a, a couple of years now, right? And for all this talk of free speech absolutum and stuff like that, Elon Musk still maintaining the ban. It's just some bullshit. Like, but. And Matt Taibbi is lying about history when he said that the Hunter Biden laptop story was like the first URL to ever be like blacklisted from Twitter that wasn't like child pornography or whatever. No, DDoS Secrets yeah. was that, you know, they, they've they been banned, their URL, like go try to D DM someone ddossecrets.com and see what happens. There was another URL too recently, uh, Z Library. I tried to send it to somebody on Instagram and that shit fucking banned me from sending the URL. I'm like, what the hell? Like, Yeah, it doesn't even tell you why. It just says like, try again. <laughs> you yeah. can just like hit that button over and over again. Right. Actually, that Z Library oh. thing reminds me of one thing, right? Like for all this talk of crypto and Web3 and stuff like that. But first off, what is wrong with Tor? I mean, Tor and dark webs and, and all that shit, Onion servers, they're doing pretty good, right? I mean, you can still maintain and deploy that stuff. It's truly, uh, well, if you implement it correctly anyways, right? Anonymous and decentralized, you know? Yeah, the Web3 thing is so frustrating to me because we already have so much cool decentralized web stuff like Tor, you know, IPFS. Mastodon. All these, all these Mastodon, the, the whole Fediverse, right? All these really neat things. Everybody for a minute was like, no, NFTs, but this has NFTs. Right, this is yeah. Rifter, right? Like, uh, but I, I feel like I don't know, Molly. You're actually in a better position to to see this, but I, I feel like maybe some of the fervor around Web three has died down, and like, especially like with Mastodon taking off, it seems like people are like, oh right, we don't need all this bullshit blockchain to have a decentralized internet. Yeah, no. So I, I think two things there. One, I think it was very revealing that when Twitter started to go up in flames, nobody made off for the blockchain based social networks. You know, it was like everyone was like, let's go to Mastodon or to Tumblr or to these weird new things that have just been spun up and have no track record. And nobody was like, let's go over to, I don't even remember the names of the blockchain social networks because they're just so irrelevant at this point. Because mm. the only people on them are blockchain bros and nobody wants to talk to them besides other blockchain. Yeah, and it's just like crypto spam because it turns out when you have no moderation, that means you can't remove spam either. <laughs> So much spam, um, though. Like, wow, have you ever seen, like, all these DMs and Twitter? All oh, this is yeah, endless. I'm getting a yeah. lot more crypto spam on Twitter these days. It is absolutely, it's practically unusable at this point. But the other thing I was going to say on the whole decentralization thing is one thing that really does worry me a little bit about Web3 is that they have picked up on, the t like, those terms around decentralization, censorship resistance, you know, some of these really important goals to the point where I worry that they have, be, they've tried to almost make themselves synonymous with those things as though the decentralized web and web three are one and the same and that any decentralized web service needs to use a blockchain for some reason. Like, I think it's really critical that we remember and we continue to point out that you can decentralize without a blockchain. You don't need a cryptocurrency. There are no shortage of examples of decentralized projects that have nothing to do with crypto. And that, you know, these are probably worth our time. And, you know, we should be supporting projects like this that are actually, you know, making a difference and, you know, performing an interesting service uh, and not just trying to get you to buy into their token. Yeah. And in, in fact, like you usually want to decentralize without a blockchain. Like adding a blockchain is almost always strictly worse for your like anonymity and decentralization goals, right? Like. I, this is and this is what pisses me off so much. Like blockchain is a really useful algorithm for one tiny niche <laughs> specific problem that almost nobody ever needs to solve, and like it, it, people just like want to apply this magical blockchain sauce 
on everything that it, where it's not needed. Like it's like, what about taxis, but with blockchain? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. What about, what about Tor, but we have a blockchain for some fucking reason? I'm like, no, no, you don't need that algorithm. It's just an algorithm. It's not cool. Like, stop fucking using it. I think the problem is that it's actually very useful for two things. One is the actual technological purpose that it was meant for, which, like you said, is very limited. It's also like catnip for venture capitalists. Like, you just yeah, dangle right. a blockchain in front of... Yeah, right. Mark Andreessen, and he just starts, he gets like a money cannon and just points it at you. <laughs> money cannon, that's it's hilarious. It's useful for the grift. It's almost like some of the worst things about the internet that we had already addressed decades ago, right? The exclusivity, the DRM, right? I feel like open source and free software movement has kind of like figured that out, right? But now it's like, oh, now let's use these technologies to go backwards, right? Let's BitTorrent, right, set the internet free, but now let's go encode who owns what JPEG, like, and uh, it is actually a betrayal. There's so, of the there's so many NFT projects that are literally just new DRM. Like, there was one I saw recently around, I think Mark Cuban is doing something around um, textbooks as NFTs, and so now the publishers can also take a cut of any resales, and it's like, oh, great, that's what we've always needed in the textbook industry is more extraction. Right. It's like multi-level marketing Ponzi schemes. What industries have we not infected with this yet? Right. Where can we be taking more money from our customers? I mean, that's, but that's like the, that's the essential function of capitalism, right? It's like, you, if you have to grow infinitely, you always have to, it's this extractivist mindset, right? You always have to be extracting more wealth. You always have to be finding new ways to extract the last cent from people. And, and it's, uh, we gotta kill it or it's gonna kill us. Yes, it's gotta go. Back to our old school hacker conversation, Jeremy and Jason, it's been, so it's been really disappointing going to hacker conferences lately and seeing how much the military industrial complex and like the financial industry and all the like worst people you know have all like wormed their way in and like really become a core part of quote unquote the hacker community, right? Like I, it, I really don't think there's a hacker community anymore, right? There's a hacker industry and there are a ton of grifters and and terrible fucking people who have attached themselves to it um and like i i really would love to you gave this really uh fiery speech at defcon i like 18 i think where you were trying to like rile hackers up to go like do direct action and shit and i don't know i think we need more of that i think we need more um pushing back against this fucking military industrial complex and this like cyber warfare industrial complex bullshit yeah uh, within the hacker space and more hackers saying like no fuck this we we are not for these guys we do not work with these motherfuckers let's actively push back against that hell yeah no you're that's you're right call, that's my call to action it's time <laughs> to call out the sellouts and the frauds sick of this shit man doing this shit oh they're calling themselves technologists or oh, they're uh but they're working for the military, the NSA, all these like billion dollar crypto businesses that bankrupted everybody. Like, uh, no, it's time to call them out. It's time to draw a line in the sand. That's why I brought you two on this because both of y'all are, are very much invested in this and you're coming from a place of uh, ethics and a place of, uh, you know what I'm saying, not this hyper financialization, individualization. Like it's a, your critical analysis and coverage in these issues is really kind of giving a clarifying uh, light to what hackers and technologists and coders, uh, people who are just into this for the right reasons, what we should be doing. And, and I, ultimately, I do think it's not a dystopian message, man. We can build a better world, but we might have to burn the old one first. We might have to make some room. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes you have to make tough decisions, right? When you're uh, working for something you really care about. And I think more people really need to be thinking really hard about what they're deciding to do these days. Just the old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. <laughs> but, but actually, now is the time of grifters. Yeah. <laughs> No. Well, thanks for coming on, both y'all. Um, I mean, any last shout-outs, any last thoughts, goodbyes? Thanks to y'all for doing this and keeping it real. Yeah, thanks for having me, for uh, for having this conversation. It was great. My last shout-out would be unionize your workplace. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Hackers of the world, unite. <laughs>
So we're back with our guest, Cooper Quinton. He's a public interest technologist with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Cooper, we go way back. We're old school hackers. Man, it's so great to have you on. How you been? Yeah, man, I'm good. It's so great to be here. And yeah, we've known each other uh, since way back in the day. I was working on Hack Block. You were working on Hack This Site, Hack This Zine. That's right. We started working on Hack This Zine together. The good old Hack days. Hack Block had an ad on Hack This Site. Those were the good old days. Man. Oh, yeah. 2005. Yeah, 2005. The Bush yeah. years, uh, anti-war protests, V for Vendetta came out. It was a more innocent time compared to the um, timeline that we're in right now, right? Yeah, we didn't, we didn't know how good we had it. <laughs> Yeah, but now look how far we've come. Some of us have not given up the fight. Some of us have not sold out. You yourself, uh, you know, now that you're with the EFF, man, you're doing good work. EFF, of course, has been a, a leading in the fight for digital freedoms and uh, privacy, amongst other things. And we brought you on the show to talk about some of your contributions and just comment on the state of the world. Yeah, man. Thanks. And uh, thanks for the platform. Yeah, EFF. So I've only sold out mildly. I'm working for the uh, nonprofit industrial complex now mm -hmm. instead of uh, doing more direct action and legally riskier uh, things. But that's the state in my life that I'm in now. I have a couple of kids now and I'm uh, smart enough to know that if you have kids, you should probably stop doing illegal shit so you don't get put in a position like Sabu where you decide to snitch. Right. Um, that's one of the things yes, I wanted I to talk to you about, actually. Yeah. Much respects for how far you come in this matter. Kind of just talking about the hacker narrative in the United States, generally speaking. It seems like there's just a trope, like a, an arc that is just like an accepted part, and maybe in the United States specific, but um, that, you know, when you're young and dumb, you know, you mess around with hacking, you might be uh, tough enough to just break a few laws, get into some systems, but you don't really know what you're doing, but you're caught. And then, like, the government, eventually, it's time to mature or grow up or whatever, right? And then you got to sell out, and then you got to... You start working for the man, you start fixing the corporate vulnerabilities that you had once hacked. But this is bullshit, right? I mean, the first off, not everybody's like that. What do you what do you think about that hacker narrative? It ain't gotta be like that, right? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a bullshit narrative. I think it's a really clever piece of capitalist propaganda, right? Like get your get your you know, get your yachts when you want when you're young, get your illegal fun out, and then you get caught and then you go work to improve corporate profits or improve mm -hmm. government security, right? And it's it's I think it's total bullshit, right? It's like played out. first of all, you can avoid getting caught. L lots of people do, right? Phineas Fisher has, still has not been caught, right? Or whoever, whatever group of people are behind that, right? Respect. Still haven't been caught. Lots of good hackers have not been caught. There's a capitalist incentive, right, to put out bank robber movies to where the bank robber always gets caught at the end, mm -hmm. right? But the, the fact is, like, if you look at statistics, a lot of bank robbers don't get caught, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but in an authoritarian society, you want to build this propaganda that the police always win, right? The good guys always win. The cowboys always ride off into the sunset. And it's, mm. and it's total bullshit. But, you know, uh, there's also, like, depending on what other risk factors you have, if you're undocumented, if you have small children, right? You Not everyone is suited in their lives to doing illegalist actions. And it's important so you don't end up in a situation where you have to compromise <clears throat> your comrades. It's important to think about right. whether you're actually suited to that life and if like me you you are no longer suited to that life but you don't want to sell out and start you know fixing vulnerabilities to make elon musk richer <laughs> right an option is to become a public interest technologist hmm. yeah i mean that's what's up i mean like you had said uh you have to know when to hang hang up your hat and to move on or keep them guessing you can't be doing the same things over and over again and in your case like you said you had kids and you know saying um so it's time to move on to a different phase uh, open a different chapter of your life and uh, respects for that i mean you earned your stripes you put into work i'd like to talk to you more about uh, some of the work that you're doing with the eff just also on the side fuck sabu also he had kids and he should have thought he should have cut and ran when he had the chance but um yeah blue fuck sabu man so, hell of a world right now, right? I want to talk about just the state of hacktivism, the state of uh, government surveillance, uh, and what the EFF is doing. Uh, you've written a number of articles, most recently, talking about how people are using Tor to help uh, people in Iran uh, undermine internet censorship. And maybe you could talk about that. Snowflake, uh, what's all this? Yeah, so Snowflake is a pretty recent uh, improvement to bridges uh, that Tor came out with a couple years ago that is helping people avoid or get around internet censorship 
Uh, so it's, it's really cool. The way Snowflake works, it is a bridge to Tor. So it helps you get on Tor, but through a proxy, essentially, right? But that proxy is a WebRTC connection, which WebRTC is the technology that powers Discord, which we're using right now. It's the technology that powers Zoom or Skype or any sort of peer-to-peer real-time communication on the internet. And so how Snowflake works is people sign up to be Snowflake proxies. You can install a browser add-on, or you can even just open a web page, or you can run it in a server. And then people who want to get on tour that are in censored countries like Iran or Russia can make a WebRTC connection directly to your computer and then use your computer as a proxy to get onto the tour network. So it's really cool because it means that for a country to censor Snowflake, they would have to shut down the internet, which is certainly something that countries are willing to do. We've seen internet shutdowns mm-hmm. uh, increasingly. Or they'd have to you know, block entire US IP blocks. They'd have to really cripple their own internet to shut down Snowflake. Right, so this is a major advancement actually, because um, I remember back in the day they would set up Tor bridges, like IP addresses, but that's kind of like a cat and mouse game, right? Because you know, you have to make that IP bridge known to people to get to it, right? But then the government would also know when they just block it and so forth. So you are actually just, dis- Snowflake's disguising the traffic through like like regular yeah. Yeah, pluggable. Yeah, so it's, it's really cool. So the way that it works, yeah, it's disguising it as just normal like WebRTC traffic, right? So like it could be two people talking over Discord or over Zoom or something else. And you have to have a broker that initiates those connections. This is how WebRTC works, right? There has to be a server that says like okay there is a broker server that hands out connections right you as this the snowflake client the person who wants to get on tour uh connects to this broker and says like hey give me an ip address of a snowflake proxy and then the broker hands you a snowflake proxy from somebody who's running snowflake on a server or on their computer and why don't countries just censor that one broker ip address that would shut the whole thing down What they've done is they've used this really interesting technique called domain fronting, which is where they host the broker on like a Google Cloud server, right? And then through a quirk of HTTPS, they can make the request to google.com on the wrapper outside of the unencrypted part of the HTTPS request. But then on the inside of the TLS wrapper, the host header is set to broker snowflake dot tour dot whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and that and that part isn't seen by anybody other than Google. So to the outside world, it looks like a normal TLS request to Google. So to block it, the country would have to block all of Google. Hmm. Right. Uh, and then they would also have to block the IPs that are acting as Snowflake clients, which you can't get a list of. Right. Hmm. How bridges worked before was that you could set up a bridge, but first of all, you could only set up a bridge on a VPS or, you know, on a server somewhere that was directly connected to the Internet. Right. Hmm. Um, you couldn't set it up on like your home computer for somewhat technologically complicated mm-hmm. reasons involving like NAT traversal and and uh, network address translation and things like that. Mm-hmm. But also then Tor had this list of bridge IP addresses, right? And you have to have a way to distribute those bridge IP addresses to people. Uh, but any way that you have to distribute those bridge IPs can also, you know, like a government can also request bridge IPs and just block mm-hmm. the bridges right. uh, as they find them. So like you said, it's a cat and mouse game so what snowflake is snowflake has done two things it's made it easier to distribute those bridge ips but harder for a government entity to like get the list and block them it's also made it easier much easier like magnitudes easier for people to set up bridges from the comfort of their own home yeah yeah i uh i did have a chance to try uh, Mm on the snowflake like you had said uh they had made it really easily for everyday people to support the people in Iran who want to be able to get around internet censorship. They All they got to do is install this browser plugin, right? So I got this browser plugged in and it'll, it'll tell you the number of people who had connected uh, uh, that we had used to uh, circumvent censorship. That's pretty cool. Um, as a browser plugin, it's pretty powerful too. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, it's super cool. Um, and yeah, it's, yeah, a lot of people have been using it. Uh, it's, it's helped a ton of people in Iran uh, get past censorship. 
uh, talking to the tour folks, the most connections they get is from uh, to Snowflake is from Iran and Russia currently of people trying to to get on and get around the blocks and share information about what's going on. You know, especially right now in Iran. Right. Um, but also, you know, in Russia, what's going on there with anti-war protests, you know, with any sort of, uh, you know, if you're queer in Russia, it's not a good place to be queer, right? Like, so mm-hmm. any, any, any sort of internet freedom, right? Like, Russia is pretty bad when it comes to internet freedom. Right. Also, major props to the uh, hackers who took down the uh, Russian internet censorship organization uh, and a whole, all kinds of hacking going on, right? And we, it's an international crisis. There's wars going on and people on the internet are rising up and standing in solidarity with folks in both Iran and Russia against their governments. I want to actually ask you, this is a good transition to the state of hacktivism. And you had also written an article kind of in the early days of the war about xenophobia in hacktivism. I mean, just in general, I know we're kind of disconnected, you know, definitely not involved in the day-to-day operations and anonymous or hacking and stuff like that. So we're just like reading public news sources. But maybe you could comment about what's up with this, uh, this whole situation right now. Stuff in Iran, stuff in Iran, Russia getting hacked like a motherfucker. Yeah, for sure, man. I, there's a lot of there's a lot of really cool hacks going on right now uh, in 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 Iran in Russia. Um, but I, I what I was what I was seeing at the start of the war between Russia and Ukraine was these really, uh, in my opinion, poorly thought out like sort of hacktivist uh, actions. Like we saw people just kind of blasting the entire Russian IP space with a packet that said, uh, you know, no war or something like that, right? People putting code in their open source projects to, to like delete itself or, or do some other shit if it was running in a Russian IP space, right? And huh. that's like, to me, that's just a really shitty idea. Like you're discounting any possible allies you might have in Russia, right? You're discounting... Mm-hmm. Anybody who might be on the border between Russia and Ukraine, right, who your software will decide mm-hmm. is a Russian IP address, right, because the IP geolocation is so bad. You're really, you're punishing everybody in the entire country for the actions of their fucking oligarchs and military bastards. Right. Right? And I think that when you are doing activism, you should try to actually go after the people in power right, right. uh you got to be like, specific yeah and i mean there's there is and that that's not always the case right like freeway shutdowns are really important right and i'm obviously very much in favor of freeway shutdowns and hmm. that does that does impact people who are driving who have nothing to do with the thing right like there is something to be said for just like shutting down the machinery right. of a country, right? And like Hell yeah, there is something to be said about it. Economic fun- yeah. functioning. But this wasn't that either, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is the things I was seeing was like a, a like, you know, shame on all Russians, but like, you know, like really kind of like slacktivism, right? Mm-hmm. Like it really felt like the, this is probably betraying my age, but like back when Answer was protesting the war in 2003, right? With these little like permanent marches on the sidewalk, right? Mm-hmm. That like with signs that you like wave and everybody feels good. It felt like feel good activism and not actually like well thought out activism to either target those in power or to like shut down the economic machinery right like i would have loved to see and you know eventually we did see people releasing emails and documents from gazprom on ddos secrets right yeah we saw you know taking over tv stations right yeah you know actually attacking the governments i mean hell attack the military infrastructure or whatever right like right. i think that there are so many more well thought about or you know like actually take a minute to listen to what people in those countries, right, Mm. are saying is important. Like, if you're going to do activism to support folks in Iran, to support folks in Russia, right, like, take a minute, take some time, immerse yourself in that Mm. struggle, like, and, and spend more time listening and less time hacking, right? Like, figure out what their actual goals are, what actual good targets are, and then go after that shit. Right. Don't just bam all of Iran with a packet that like three system administrators are going to read and roll their fucking eyes and move on with their day. Right. No, that's a very good point. It's absolutely essential that you do kind of understand the international context when you are choosing to kind of lend solidarity to folks in these other countries, because there's a lot of factors at play here, especially when it comes to, I've always kind of been like being born and raised in the United States. I've been a little, maybe we should clean up our own mess first before we start going around and, you know, but then again, yeah. There's something to be said that a struggle, an injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere, right? And so um, yeah. 
Anonymous and kind of hacktivism in general, I would say, has lent its hand uh, in the struggles of people all over the world uh, in a positive way, I would say, overall. But you just, yeah. just got to be careful not to get duped, of course, into like inadvertently supporting U.S. imperialism in some of these countries, too. Like, you know, yeah, there's, there's, exactly. Don't, I mean, don't be anybody's useful idiot, you know. Like, yeah. I think we can all exercise our brain cells and decide. To me, the situation in Iran feels pretty clear cut, right? People are tired of living under a theocracy, right? People are tired of living under this like extremely authoritarian regime, right? And like, I can I can recognize the freedom struggle that I support, right? But mm -hmm. like, also how I think it needs support as a as as somebody in the US and what sort of support they actually need could be two very different things, right? Yeah. Let's say hypothetically, I'm sitting there trying to leak the emails of the regime, right? And people on the ground are are saying like actually like what we need is more signal proxies so that we can get people on signal. Mm -hmm. We don't need the regime's fucking emails. We know they're corrupt. Mm -hmm. Like nobody's mind is going to change because some emails came out. What we need is ways to communicate with each other on the ground and ways to get fucking videos of police atrocities out to the world, right? Mm -hmm. So like that's 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 what I'm saying, right? Is it's not like don't support international struggles. Absolutely do support international struggles cuz we're all this world is completely fucking connected and all of our struggles are the same right but like listen to the people in those struggles that you're allied with and actually you know listen to what their real needs are right, right. one of the things that i've that i've come across a lot in eff is that there's this there's this certain type of person that wants to write a encrypted chat app for activists, right? Or an encrypted chat app for sex workers or whoever else, right? And and it's it, it's like, we don't need another encrypted chat app. There's There are really good encrypted chat apps and you also don't need an encrypted chat app for activists because <laughs> if you have an encrypted chat app for activists, it's only activists that are on it and that's a prime target for police, for law enforcement, for whoever, right? If you have a chat app that's only for sex workers, right, you can bet it's going to be filled with uh, law enforcement and with snitches, right? Like, mm. I get that, like, as a hacker, you want to do something sexy and cool and write some cool cryptography. But, like, if you actually go to the communities that you want to support, what you're going to find that they actually need is, like, basic tech support, right? Basic security advice. How do I use a password manager? How do I use two-factor authentication, right? Like, how do I make a secure password? And that type of stuff, right? And like, it's not always, the work isn't always gonna be sexy and fun. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, like your best, your best bet for supporting your local community might not be to develop a new chat app. It might be to help them use signal or whatever thing they're already using uh, just like your best bet to support people in iran might not be to might not always and sometimes it might right uh, but might not be to go uh you know leak emails from uh from the mullah or whatever but to go to set up signal proxies so people can talk to each other right mm -hmm. so it's important to to kind of get rid of your hubris and get rid of your like desire to to do the sexy thing right and mm -hmm. actually just listen to folks and do do the work that is needed. Now, there has also been, of course, a series of high-profile, spectacular, sexy hacks, right? Uh, I mean, not to... And and those are beautiful. Don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. Big supporters. Uh, just to just yeah. go go through them real quick, yeah. Um, in Russia, they hacked state TV, the radio broadcasting company, the Internet Censorship Agency, the Central Bank for the Rights Day, and they released hundreds of thousands of emails and documents. Um, Anonymous, but also other groups, uh, Network Battalion 65, DDoS secrets, like you had mentioned, uh, had been um, uh, leaking some of the uh, materials that had been submitted to them. Uh, and, uh, and and granted, like all the flash in the pan hacktivism stuff is, is cool and all, but a lot of the, the hard work uh, does come down to, like you had said, finding ways to like like actually follow the, the lead of the folks who are actually in the struggle for self-determination. And also the journalist work that uh, is in, entailed uh, going through some of these emails. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know you said everybody knows the stuff's corrupt, but I don't know. Like, it seems like the work is not just the hacking and the leaking, but it's also, like, the journalists who are taking the time to go through some of the materials that have been hacked. Because it, it's almost like every time I see one of these leaks, it's like terabytes of data hacked. It's like terabytes. He's, he's like, dude, are people actually going through all these terabytes and identifying, like, some of these controversies, the scandals? Because... Um, Otherwise, right. if, if no one's following up on that stuff, like, it's just a number. Oh, 100 gigabytes leaked. Yeah. Uh, 10 yeah, websites exactly. defaced. Like, 
Yeah. Like you're you're giving them when you when you when you do the hack, it's you know you're giving them a black eye, right? But like when you actually go through and when somebody goes through and does some journalism and actually analyzes that data mm-hmm. and finds the like actual fucking admissions of crimes in yeah. there, right? Like that's that's when you give them much more than a black eye. And yeah, like let me you know don't get me wrong, I I absolutely i mean i love to see all these really cool hacks right yeah i love to see the hacked tv stations i, I love to see uh oil companies out on their ass hell yeah right it's it's more right. than, it's more than just a defacement though like it's more than yeah. just the black eye like it's the follow-up and the hard work to hold them hold their feet to the yeah. fire not just yeah and it it takes all of it right like like diversity i just I, not to sound like a liberal, but diversity of tactics is super important. But like diversity of tactics doesn't just mean doing the boring shit. It also does mean doing direct action, right? Yeah. It's all important. Right. The direct action is important. The support is important. The analysis and reporting and propaganda and propaganda by deed is all mm-hmm. important. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah, it is. And this kind of brings me to the next question about uh, direct action hacktivism and um, offensive hacktivism and stuff. But we're not just... We're not the only ones doing this direct action hacktivism or breaking into computer systems and stuff, right? Uh, nation states are obviously very much involved in this conflict as well. And uh, kind of brings me to the next thing I wanted to ask you about United States law enforcement and military, kind of their role in using and, um, you know, being the largest purchasers of zero days on the on the market and stuff like that. But uh, also like NSO group Pegasus uh, has been in the news. Uh, the FBI actually earlier this month kind of released some info saying that they had purchased Pegasus from NSO group for like 500,000 or something like that, but they had never actually used it or whatever, right? Of course, we know the FBI does and uh, legally has the, the right to use, you know, offensive hacking tools uh, in the course of quote unquote criminal investigations and to execute search warrants, they use hacking tools, right? So really like kind of where, where is the legal ambiguity of the ethical line here? Like are, how are they pur- purporting themselves to be like the, like you said, the cowboys, the white hats and stuff like that, but they're doing the same dirty shit that we are. And this is just stuff that we know about. Like they're saying that, well, we don't, we haven't actually used Pegasus. I, I, I mean, what's your thoughts on all that? Yeah, that, I mean, that, first of all, that article was absolutely wild. I, I think the, the, the quote that stuck with me in that article was, um, was the FBI director saying, uh, well, we only bought Pegasus, uh, so we could find out, uh, how the bad guys could use it. Right. And like, that's, that's ridiculous. Right. That's like, if I was like, I, yeah, I only, I only bought this AR 15 to find out, uh, how Nazis are shooting AR 15s. Right. <laughs> like I'm never actually going to shoot it. I just want to know how they work right. so that I can, uh, you know, dodge the bullets better or some <laughs> shit like, like that's, that's such yeah. obvious bullshit. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and it's, it's, I mean, I'm never, I'm never shocked when the New York Times uncritically prints a uh, piece of government propaganda, right? But like, that's, that's just, that's even just so fucking mm-hmm. lazy, right? Like, it's so clearly bullshit. Mm-hmm. Uh, hacking isn't just a a hobby thing anymore. It's not just a, it's not just a a nerdy thing. It's not just a tool taking back power from the state and from corporations. It's now a central part, a key pillar of state and corporate power Mm -hmm. it's it's deeply embedded into the military industrial complex at this point Mm -hmm. um you know there's this uh basically you know cyber war industrial complex now uh and Mm -hmm. and you have um like cyber defense contractors and you have uh the fbi and the nsa all uh developing their own hacking capabilities Mm -hmm. right uh you have rob joyce out there putting a friendly face on the NSA's hmm. uh, hacking activities, right? And yeah, the FBI and the NSA, like you said, are some of the largest buyers of zero days. Uh, and they do a lot of work also with defense contractors now who are mm-hmm. also all have their own cyber capabilities. I can't, I can't remember if either Raytheon or Lockheed Martin, probably both of them have their own cyber ranges now, right? Which is like where they go train people to hack shit uh, and defend shit on like a, what they call a range, right? So it's, hacking is a weapon now, right? And it's being used, it's, you know, having billions of dollars poured into developing this capability. The fact is that they don't need to buy, like they don't need to use Pegasus because they have their own shit, right? The CIA had their own shit until it got leaked, right? And probably has new shit now. They were probably really upset when the uh, whole uh, Vault 7 stuff came out with the um, NSA's uh, toolkit. 
And, and like you said, like these military industrial complexes be using the vulnerability stuff like that against the people. Uh, of course, they're the good guys still, right? Did Saudi Arabia use Pegasus, right, to go after Khashoggi? Is that, was that something that had happened? Yeah, we, so we don't have the evidence that, that uh, Saudi Arabia had put Pegasus on Khashoggi's phone itself. But Pegasus was found on the phone of his wife all of his closest co-workers, um, like pretty much everybody he knew. It seems pretty clear circumstantially, for any listeners who aren't uh, familiar with this, Pegasus is this somewhat, it's, it's sort of the, the cream of the crop malware for phones that's used to target activists and journalists, uh, human rights defenders, people all over the world. Uh, um, and it, it has capabilities like tracking your location, uh, reading all your text messages, including like WhatsApp and Signal messages, turning on your microphone and having a hot mic, uh, to, you know, taking pictures, getting files off your phone, putting files on your phone. Mm. So it, it's it's the next best thing just to having you know physical access to your phone, uh, and and actually in a way even better because the the target you know for an NSO group won't ever know even that they've they've been hacked. But yeah, it seems it seems pretty clear that Pegasus was an important part of Saudi Arabia's operation to assassinate Jamal Khashoggi. It's fucking terrible, man. And and I think we're seeing more and more malware being used by governments to go after activists, to go after journalists. <clears throat> it kind of reminds me of like, do you remember the, like the Call to the Dead Cows uh, hacktivismo license, where they were like a license that they had developed that basically is like. You could use your software for anything, but if you are a human rights uh, violating state, that you are not given the permission to use your software. It's like a license, right? Yeah, like, yeah, I remember that license. Uh, I I thought it was really cool at the time. I remember, I think there was some uh, criticism that like it would basically be unenforceable in court. Yeah, um, and of course that criticism was all from lawyers. I w I work with a lot of lawyers, so you know, like respect. Uh, there there's there are you know the lawyers I work with do great work, but like. If you are a lawyer, you also like kind of have to believe in the inherent legitimacy of laws, right? Mm. And like my, and, and I am not a lawyer. I'm an anarchist. I don't believe in the inherent legitimacy <laughs> of laws, right? right? And my my pushback against that was like, well, it's a great piece of propaganda, right? It's a great like like reframing and like making people think differently about how, you know, like, do I want to put this shit out there and let anybody use it for free? Right. Do I want to do free work for fucking Lockheed Martin? Right. right. Or do I want to put this thing on it that says like, no, nah, Lockheed Martin is not allowed to use it. Even if Lockheed Martin still uses it. And even if you can't enforce that in court, you're still putting mm. your line in the sand. Right. So I wouldn't I wouldn't think of it as like a magic shield, right? Like companies break laws all the fucking time. They're yeah. not gonna if they, if something is useful to them, they're not gonna avoid using it just because like the license says they can't. Uh, they'll figure out a way, right? But I, I think it's still important to draw that line in the sand. So yeah, I think the yeah. hack my license was cool as hell. Right. Well, yeah, like you said, I would like to see more people think about the implications of the technology that they're releasing into the world, especially if they think that it could be used by nation states to violate people's rights and uh, commit human rights uh, atrocities and so and war crimes and stuff, right? Drawing that line in the sand, uh, these technologists, like, we're just doing it for the paycheck, but they're working for companies, like you said, Lockheed Martin, or uh, I want to talk about these prison contractors, Securus and Global Telling, right? You've done quite a bit of research into these companies, the private prison contractors, new patents and new technologies that they're developing. Yeah, you know, part of the part of the thing about being a technologist is it's not always about writing code, right? Uh, so this is a project that uh, me and my colleague Beryl Lipton did, where we dug into the patent database and looked for patents from Securus and Global Telling, which are two of the biggest private prison phone companies. I mean, I don't have to explain it to you, Jeremy. Uh, yeah. But uh, for the people at home, they, you know, they make their money off of nickel and diming prisoners to death for just wanting to communicate with their loved ones, right? Right, um, basic phone, and, which is basically free now anyways, right? Yeah, yeah. And we found some really wild shit that they're developing, right? Things from like AR for prison guards so that like prison guards could get like, re you know, real time information on every inmate they're looking at stuff like there were uh, prison guard robots that they were developing oh, right? that could uh, uh, deploy less lethal force or that could um, 
do all the things that prison guards to do, but now you don't have to have a human in the loop anymore, right? And like, I mean, actually, I'm I'm I, I don't know, I'm a little conflicted on that one because like obviously, like I, again, I don't have to tell you how fucking right. shitty and corrupt and power trippy prison guards are, right? So you know, at least a robot probably isn't going to. Um, you know, do some of the worst things that prison guards do. Well, I don't know. I mean, the whole um, thing about this AI stuff is, is a black box and, and what people are putting into it. There's a lot that could but, be baked in that, uh, you know, because it's mostly like these white cishet males developing this technology, right? And all the biases and prejudices are, are baked in if they don't aren't consciously... Yeah. And we're talking about people who have no ethical or moral qualms working for these private prison contracts. They're building robo-kill bots, you know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I, technology isn't, like, there's a lot of really, really crazy stuff we found uh, that I would totally encourage people to go read about. Um, check out the link in the show notes. You know, at the end of the day, it's, it, you know, it's, technology isn't <laughs> neutral, right? And a lot of programmers, a lot of, uh, a lot of nerds want to think that, like, their work is neutral, right? Like, mm-hmm. it's, I'm just... I'm just writing this code and it goes out there, right? Like, I don't have any political impact. I don't. I'm not doing anything right. Or like, even even security researchers, right? Like people or hackers or whatever. They're like, yeah, my my work is neutral. I'm just like fiddling around in this thing, mm-hmm. and none of it is neutral. None of it is politically neutral. absolutely. You're, you're always building towards some sort of future, right? Like, you're either building toward this future of capitalist fascism, right, and, yep. and authoritarian control. Right, uh, or you can build toward a future of fully automated luxury queer space communism. Hell yeah! Right? You know what's interesting is that a lot of these uh, reforms being sold to us, specifically with police, are done so in the name of community policing or reforms or technology is, is supposedly in the name of helping folks. You know, specifically like what you had researched, some of these tablets and stuff like that. They're being sold all across the United States right now. Is a trend in quote unquote corrections is that they're doing away with physical mail. And they're replacing yeah. things with tablets. And there's a whole host of problems that go along with that. Not to mention the uh, the cost, because it's a private company. And like you said, they're nickeling and diming prisoners just to be able to send. They charge like a, quote, stamp for an electronic postcard or some dumb shit, right? Yeah. But also monitoring. It helps them monitor and create like a kind of a dragnet of people that they are corresponding with. And, uh, and then, yeah. of course, the danger is also of it being these private companies in the first place. It's a black box, not just in the AI algorithms, but you can't even FOIA some of these companies, right? Like... Yeah, exactly. You can't FOIA a private company, uh, you know, even if they are working with the government, you can, you can FOIA, even if they're a government contractor, you can FOIA their communications with government officials, but you can't FOIA anything else, right? You can't FOIA the company directly. So as you privatize all these things, right, you get rid of any transparency. And yeah, the tablet thing is really insidious, right? Like what Securus and GTL want to do is monetize and they want to remove any in-person connection. They're also trying mm-hmm. to remove in-person visits, right? Like, oh yeah they want to monetize and control every second of every prisoner's life right mm. they want to build alternate revenue streams right? they want to show ads to prisoners right oh, showing oh. ads to fucking prisoners oh, like God. what like what the fuck are you like like <laughs> oh shit i better i should i better buy snickers in my commissary because i got a fucking ad for that like what an insane idea right wow. one of the wildest patents i saw was they had a patent to start mining data from people who called prisoners like if you if you call the prisoner, they would start mining data from your Amazon account. Like check on your Amazon purchases to make sure that you weren't purchasing anything that might help the prisoner. That you weren't purchasing anything like weapon or drug paraphernalia related or something like that to send to the prisoner. What the like fuck? so they they not only want to monetize and spy on every aspect and every second of prisoner's life they want to loop in everybody that that incarcerated person knows in this state of carceral mm-hmm. control right wow. and, and like you also have uh this switch to electronic monitoring right now right instead of ankle bracelets you have an app that does all the same things an ankle bracelet does it does a lot of the same things that pegasus does the hmm. only difference is that you know it's on your phone because the state has threatened you with violence if you don't have it on your phone mm. but this also lowers the barrier to carceral control right an electronic monitor an ankle monitor costs a lot of money but it costs almost nothing to deploy this app you know you can make everybody install this as soon as they are pre-trial as soon as they get arrested you can make them install oh. you can make anybody who's under any sort of ice jurisdiction install this it's about expanding the scope of the carceral state and it's really fucking terrifying right yeah there can, it seems like they're kind of redrawing the fence and kind of roping in like people who are not even directly caught up in the system but they're trying to extend that net to cover basically everybody 
Oh, and then there was the whole RoboCop AR glasses thing you were talking about that, like, would facial recognition to people and tell them your charges and detect self contraband cell phones and all this weird stuff. What the hell? What? Yeah, I mean, the, the thing with patents is that companies will patent anything that they think of, mm. right, just in case they might want to actually invent it in the future, right? Just because they have these patents doesn't mean that all of these things are going to become products, mm. right? The thing that companies often do, right, is just, like, colonize that intellectual property right so that nobody else can you know have that idea without paying them some money right so like even if they're not going to do the thing they just patent it anyway mm -hmm. but it says a lot about their mental state like what they're thinking like what their vision of the future is right even if they don't make every one of those technologies their vision of the future involves that you know that level of control right controlling everybody monetizing every second controlling every second and mediating every interaction and every experience getting rid of any last vestiges any last scraps of privacy or interpersonal connection or anything that you might be able to scrape off of the floor in prison damn man this is, what a hell of a future we got got to look forward right whatever happened to the whole uh, the promise of uh, techno liberal future man like this was it all just a a dream and we, and we were all just sleeping and now we woke up we're in this like crypto capitalist hell like what the fuck yeah man i mean I, eff was sort of founded on this you know techno utopian vision thinking about how we could use the internet to really bring everybody together if everybody just talks to each other everybody uh will all get along right and uh like i think that was a like sort of a cute hippie notion that you know disregards that some people are just fucking fascists yeah it disregards that like any sufficiently useful tool will quickly become co-opted by capitalists and authoritarians hmm. and used for their own ends i still think that i mean i still am a firm believer in fully automated luxury space <laughs> anarchism like i am still definitely a techno utopian i think that we can have some really awesome shit with technology but right now technology is definitely a force multiplier for capitalists and for fascists more than it is for us um, but I think that it's important for us to constantly push back against that, to not cede that ground, right? To not give give up that fight because it is so important. Hell yeah. A another technologist is possible, right? <laughs> Uh, yes. Yeah. Another another internet is possible. Another technology is possible, and another world is possible. Yeah. Right. And we we can't cede any ground to these fuckers. Mm -mm. We refuse. Now, of course, the uh, promise of anonymity and decentralization with crypto has kind of been a flop, right? I mean, it's, it hasn't lived. It's just another uh, false promise. But I was wondering if you, I, I think the EFF had come out in support of um, the developer of one of the developers at BitTornado um, had come out in support on on some code is a right or code is speech type of grounds. Yeah, that wasn't something that I directly worked on, but our our stance there was, and our stance always has been uh, this the free speech stance that code is speech, right? And that you can't arrest somebody for writing code, right? Mm -hmm. BFF would not argue that you can't arrest somebody for laundering money, right? Like there are very clear laws about money laundering, right? Mm -hmm. But for writing Tornado, just for writing the software that used in a Bitcoin tumbler, right? That should not be illegal. And I, I agree with that stance. I yeah. think that that is a correct stance. I don't think you should arrest people for writing software. I don't think you should arrest people for writing malware. Right. That is still a form of speech. And a lot of malware researchers like myself write malware to learn how malware works, right? Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't argue I, I wouldn't argue that you should arrest the people in NSO group for writing malware. I think you should arrest the people in NSO group for their complicity in war crimes and murder. Yeah. Right? I think you should arrest them for 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 working with horrible fucking uh well, I mean all governments are human rights violating governments. Yeah. Um but, you know, like like there there's tons of bad shit they they have done, right? But like I think um you know, you can't arrest somebody for writing code. That's, I stand pretty firmly with that. EFF does have some some level of uh, free speech absolutism that I do tend to disagree with. Somewhat of an element of like, you know, we have to let Nazis say Nazi things, right? And I think that that's complete bullshit. Yeah. Like, I don't think we ever have to give Nazis free speech because they don't actually believe in free speech. 
Right. Right. Or like the ACLU, like using like time and resources to go out of the way to defend the rights of Nazis. Yeah. And when there's lots of other people that one could defend. At the end of the day, a job is still a job. Right. And I'm not going to, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still working in the nonprofit industrial complex. Right. And I'm not going to agree with everything that EFF does or says, you know, I'm still exhausted at the end of the day after working eight hours, which is still too much for anybody to be working. Right. But um, you know, like I still, I feel, I feel better about it than if I was working for Raytheon or, or some, uh, Oops. you know, uh, security company, you know, making banks more secure. Hell yeah. It's a hell of a difference, right? It's the line in the sand. If you're listening to this, uh, and, and want to follow me on Twitter before it dies, check Cooper Q, or if you want to follow me on Mastodon, it's Cooper Q at Mastodon.lol. Hit me up in the DMs and let's have a chat about whatever. So the Bitcoin conference, it's a yearly gathering of grifters, right-wing capitalists masquerading as a freedom movement. Pepe's everywhere. Guy Fox masks also everywhere. NFT galleries. They also unveiled a bull as to mark Miami as a crypto capitalist city on par with a bull of Wall Street. In fact, crypto bros were pissed they scrapped the artist's original designs to include testicles on the bull. There were also a lot of reports about sexual harassment at the Bitcoin 2022. $1,000 passes to get in too. So you're probably wondering what the hell are we even doing there? It's not normally our scene. And we were invited there to talk with the other people from the Free Ross DAO who are involved in kind of support work. Now, Ross as in Ross Ulbrich, one of the progenitors of the Silk Road. And for those who don't know, he's doing double life plus 40 years in federal prison. And me and Ross go way back. First off, we were bit by the same beast. We were both busted by this FBI cybercrime officer, Chris Tarbell. And we'll talk about him later. And we briefly crossed paths in jail uh, in the visiting room, strip room uh, of all places too. So we were there at the Bitcoin conference just to talk to people about Ross's case, just to get people to sign the petition demanding his clemency and talk about prison abolition in general. So we were dressed up like pirates, you know, the DPR theme. So there we were, pirates in a sea of crypto bros. Let's take a look at some of the whales and tycoons on the open seas. Now, I'd never heard of what the fuck a whale is, but it's just rich people who made shitloads in the early days of crypto. These big shots walking around like they are the absolute shit all around the fucking conference. So who else actually spoke? Well, Jordan Peterson spoke. Tucker Carlson's Glenn Greenwald showed up. 
Even the Wolf of Wall Street showed up. Jordan Belfort's Greed is Good. The fraud fit right in. Andrew Yang was also at the conference. He later, of course, formed the Forward Party, which says we are neither left nor right, but forward. But everyone knows who says they're neither left nor right really means they're really all right. And it is, of course, a bunch of right-wingers and centrists, but they like to say they're on both sides are equally extreme type shit. George Bush and Dick Cheney are major financial backers. And also Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel was one of the keynote speakers. Famously, he ripped up dollar bills and declared the death of money. It really didn't land, but nevertheless, Peter Thiel is actually a darling to some of these people, which is kind of confusing to me. They think of him as some type of libertarian hero or something like that. He calls himself a Christian nationalist. You know, he's tied up with Palantir, Clearview AI, Bilderberg Group, very much so with military industrial complex. He's got contracts with law enforcement, basically doing all this mass surveillance stuff. So his placement here, to me, was always kind of at odds with what their stated freedom movement is. Another interesting anecdote, Peter Thiel and Candace Owens, they uh, founded this Glorify bank, some sort of anti-woke bank. Well, it collapsed after three months and everybody lost their money. Ha ha ha. Another grift bites the dust. Thiel is also a huge major financial backer of right-wing movements internationally and in the U.S. He is a heavy donator to the Republican Party, most recently J.D. Vance and Blake Masters. Now, Bitcoin is very much kind of Peter Thiel's conference. His groups, for example, the Human Rights Foundation, is very much involved in Bitcoin. This is part of what gives them their freedom aesthetic. The Human Rights Foundation is one of those like right-wing capitalist-y think tanks that kind of like masquerade themselves in the language of human rights and civil rights and so forth. But in reality, they're just kind of like Chicago boys, free market, capitalist coup plotters. One of the main guys, Thor Halverson. His cousin, Leopold Lopez, apparently was one of the key figures in the uh, Venezuelan coup in 2002. He was an opposition leader uh, in an incident described by Amnesty International as one of the most serious human rights violations perpetuated during the short-lived coup d'etat is the cousin of the, the leader of the Human Rights Foundation. And just in general, Human Rights Foundation is just funded by all these dark money, controversial groups such as the Donors Capital Fund, a major backer of the HRF. They fund a lot of Islamophobic groups. They've previously targeted feminist academics with this indoctrinate you thing. They have went after the environmentalist movement. And it's just general, just right-wing coup type shit. Also spoke was North Korean defector Yeonmi Park. So she speaks about human trafficking, but when she's surrounded by all these right-wingers, it seems she is only being platformed merely to add to anti-communist propaganda. She never criticizes the abuses of the U.S. or their allies, to note. Also was supposed to speak uh, was Nayib Bukele, the uh, president of El Salvador, who had invested much of his country's reserves into Bitcoin. He was supposed to speak, but he wasn't able to make it because he was dealing with the suspension of their constitution and the mass arrests of thousands. Anyways, his Bitcoin investment has since lost more than half its value and none surprising has not really seemed to generate the hoped widespread usage or the prosperity of the freedoms. There was a ridiculous, huge, symbolic volcano in the middle of the conference. A uh, hell of a symbol. Shell is sponsoring the 2023 and 2024 conference. Big banks are part of it all now, eroding away at decentralization. It's adopting the aesthetic and language of freedom, but really is just repackaging same old capitalist corruption. Anyone who has ever bought into the dreams and ideals of the early days of cryptocurrency may be shocked about how completely co-opted and sell out the scene really is. And of course, nobody wore masks, even though the pandemic's still going around. But the whole anti-vax, anti-mask thing has just kind of been a pillar, one of the main points of this right-wing crypto so-called freedom movement. Many of them are Trump supporters, of course, but there wasn't a lot of red hats around, many of them preferring the Libertarian Party flavor of right-wing politics. But below the surface, there is racist Chan edgelords defining the movement. For example, one of the most successful NFT projects, the Bored Ape Yacht Club. There's tons of Nazi iconography, all these fascist dog whistles, and it was all exposed in a scathing documentary, Bored Ape Nazi Club. Yet still, people paid millions for these racist JPEGs, even all these celebrities like Snoop Dogg and Jimmy Fallon. But since then, the NFT market collapsed. Image is basically worthless now. We won't be going back, but we did have a good time anyways. It's Miami. At one point, we were chilling on the beach we looked up and we saw a plane flying a banner, and it read, Save the world, start a DAO. <laughs> we LOL'd and jumped in the water. To understand the politics of the Bitcoin movement, it's important to look at the Libertarian Party, and specifically the fascist pivot that came with the rise of the Mises Caucus. Now, could we just say that Libertarians always sucked? But we're not going to go all into this Libertarian or anarchism stuff. There's plenty of resources out there if you're interested. But we did want to talk about the Mises Caucus and how after they took over majority control of the party during the Reno Reset, the mask came off. One of the things that happened at the Reno Reset was the removal of the We Condemn Bigotry as Irrational and Repugnant. 
a plank that was added to the party platform in the aftermath of the deadly Charlottesville Nazi rally. Removing this plank is a statement in itself in this current era of increased racist and anti-queer violence, a real leaning in of the trolling anti-woke fascist rhetoric. And the removal of the abortion plank, which occurred during the devastating Supreme Court overthrow of Roe vs. Wade. Personal freedoms against blatant government intrusion, all that was scrapped in favor of states' rights and both sides. Way to be on the freedom side of history. They use language like national divorce and secession, clear Civil War Confederacy rhetoric. They're also notably quiet and most actual oppressions people face. These days, mostly just anti-vax, anti-mask type of tyranny. Economic injustices are reduced to, well, in a free market, billionaires have the right to monopolies and sweatshops and be rich parasite assholes. The Libertarian Party was also nowhere to be found during the uprisings in response to police violence. The police were literally murdering people in the streets, and some of them actually sided with the cops and the fascists. For example, the New Hampshire party leader, Jeremy Kaufman, he uh, got in trouble for claiming Kyle Rittenhouse did nothing wrong. So there's been an exodus. Two state chapters collapsed in rejection of the Mises Caucus. A lot of people left the party, wrote open letters. Donations are way down. And, and good for the ones that left. But the ones that stayed, even if you aren't Mises, even if you don't think of yourselves as fitting into the alt-right troll mold that has come to define the new Libertarian Party. But if it's not a deal breaker for you, if you're not calling it out, if you're okay with it, well, now you got that stain. You can never get it out. And you're going down with that libertarian ship to the dustbin of history. Overall, this is indicative of breakdown and factionalization of the right wing, as Trump is increasingly detested even within his own party. They'll experiment with different formations to obscure their hateful ideologies. It's another way of rebranding fascism as some type of freedom. It's not new, and as a matter of fact, libertarian name itself was stolen in the 70s, as the word is understood around the world as synonymous with libertarian socialism and anarchism. It's a fraud, a complete contradiction, but hey, grifter's gonna grift. Yo, speaking of frauds and grifters, have you seen that bullshit ass show, The Anarchists? Do yourself a favor, don't. But let us tell you about this heaping pile of garbage. And not the good kind of garbage. Anarchapulco, a crypto conspiracy fest made into a really bad, quote, documentary series on HBO. So yeah, it's basically just a bunch of colonizing tourists just partying at their conference in Acapulco, not really interacting with the local community at all, not really doing anything to challenge state or corporate power. Originally called Stateless, it seems designed to smear actual anarchists. It opens with a five-minute book burning, something fascists are more known for. Overall, it's, it's actually pretty boring, mostly self-congratulating. A lot of times scrolling through Facebook posts, nothing really happens. Most of them are just crypto-rich or otherwise pretty well-off, not really experiencing much struggle or oppression in their lives. Their idea of freedom is mostly mad about COVID lockdowns, unschooling, and taxes. The worst thing that ever happened to them might have been getting shadow banned from Twitter for spreading disinformation about election fraud or the pandemic. So who goes to the largest worldwide anarchist conference? Well, it's an endless parade of B-list conspiracists, grifters, and crypto-fascists. It's a case study of the new age to alt-right pipeline. Mainly centers around this guy Jeff Berwick, their leader, the dollar vigilante. Let's listen to this guy. If you think, you know, Hitler wasn't great. Well, Max spent hours with me going over all the info. And yeah, it looks like Hitler was pretty good. <laughs> so surprised, right? So surprised. See, so yeah, a lot of Holocaust denialism, misinformation, disinformation, right-wing conspiracism. Enrico Poco did an event last month, actually. Uh, prepare yourself for the even cringier name for this fest of right-wing mouth shitters. Enercovid. Yeah, so we checked it out. One speaker was named Miriam Hennett who produced this new racist conspiracy documentary called George Floyd, The Real Timeline. And essentially it's the defense of the police murder in effort to discredit the BLM movement. Nobody called out how offensive and absolute bullshit it was. It was co-produced by Sean Hibbler, a flat earther conspiracy theorist from the South Suburbs of Chicago, who had also produced a previous fucked up documentary about Floyd. Also speaking was Hannah Maria, one of the founders of the Police for Freedom movement. If you look at it, it's all human rights, free speech, but basically they're just standing up for cops who refuse to get vaccinated. They even did like a bunch of marches and stuff. Now, this is actually kind of a phenomenon. Uh, Chicago police, for example, makes up 40% of the city's workforce. Almost all of them collectively refused. The Fraternal Order Police backed it. They were eventually granted an exemption for 1,700 officers who refused. Not one of them were fired. Cops, they just didn't wear masks. Cook County Jail, as a result, was actually for a while the nation's number one COVID hotspot, and a lot of people died. So there's a lot of new age life coach grifters everywhere, crypto wallet salespeople with inspiring speeches like, you have an obligation to become rich. Just a serious, what the absolute fuck is this shit vibe. Now, there's another upcoming conference, Anarchopoco, in February. 
And we're just going to take a look at some of the speakers just to give you an idea who has spoken at Acapulco and who's going to be coming up speaking at this one. Of course, the main one, Ron Paul, that's like their darling of the libertarian movement, the Ron Paul revolution, right? Remember those racist newsletters from the 90s that he signed off on? Like some really terrible shit. He was also pictured from Don Black from Storefront. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on Ron Paul, but some of the other people. David Icke, remember that guy? He's a, one of the most notorious conspiracists and also an anti-Semite. Lizard people, shapeshifters, all that. Really popular, though, still. Stefan Molyneux, who's a full-fledged white nationalist, a big promoter of scientific racism, eugenics, men's right activism, close friends with Jeff Berwick and Todd Schramke, the producer of The Anarchist. Another speaker at Anarchopolical 2022 was Ben Tapper. He's one of the disinformation dozen, one of 12 responsible for 65% of all COVID anti-vax and anti-mask propaganda. Quoted, masks have absolutely nothing to do with health, but everything to do with compliance with a false tyrannical agenda. We also have Rashid Buttar, another conspiracist who advanced 5G and chemtrail as well as anti-vax conspiracies. Another Jack Spierko, a survivalist podcast, quote, the pandemic is over, long live the pandemic. Another speaker in 2022 was Susan Sweeten. She claims to be the most censored person in Ireland. She's the CEO of Freedom to Travel Alliance, a shady company that supposedly helps anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers travel, despite the, dis quote, discrimination against those who disbelieve in COVID-19. Some more conspiracists, Dan Dix, Max Egan, Brendan Murphy, the freedom hacker. He runs the truth diversity. Write stuff like The Grand Illusion, The Synthesis of Science and Spirituality, Mark Passio, uh, New Age Satanism. He actually has an uh, anarchist hardcore punk band, uh, mostly a bunch of 3% stuff. And he does a whole lot of like We Are Change, Infowars types, Adam Kokesh. You know, you use words like liberty and tyranny a lot, kind of red flags. And of course, Miley Annapolis spoke, you know, the darling of the alt-right. Everyone knows him. So the whole theme of this whole thing is there's just, during the documentary and at the conference, there's just a deliberate omission of actual anarchists now and throughout history. No mention of anything having to do with the anarchists' involvement in the labor movement, the anti-corporate globalization movement, the anti-war movement, involvement in actions against police brutality, environmental justice. But we're supposed to believe these people are the rebels, the great resist, but they ain't done shit. You know, there's this intentional co-option of the images of revolution. You know what I'm saying? The libertarian and anarchist co-option of the, the punk aesthetic. Uh, cyberpunk specifically uh, with Bitcoin is was originally a critique of late stage capitalism. Now they're fully embracing it. You know, at these things you see Guy Fox masks, V for Vendetta masks uh, to promote cryptocurrency and stuff like that. Anonymous had nothing to do with that shit. But of course, anarcho-capitalism is a contradiction. It's a misnomer. It has nothing to do with anarchism because capitalism is incompatible with anarchism, inherently. Capitalism necessitates hierarchical, exploitative relationships between owners and working people. Laissez-faire free market capitalism doctrine necessitates police and governments because of the concept of private property ownership. Owners collude with the state to maintain a monopoly on wealth and power through police. Despite the whole non-aggression principle do no violence, but somehow, when it comes down to it, they defend the use of police violence is justified in defense of their property rights. To the point of siding with the police during the uprisings of 2020, because all actual resistance to state power must be false flag psyops. We've released a new update for our game, Smash Maga, Trump Zombie Apocalypse. And in this timeline, accelerated fascist political violence leads to civil war. The first release saw the Trump virus teaming up with Elon Musk to build a Maga X space program to colonize space with red headed, zombified right wingers. Trump so far has gotten away with all the Gen 6 shit, still technically running for president though. But if you want an idea how things are going at Team Maga, did you get a load of his major announcement? Trump's digital trading card NFT project. It had to happen eventually. Just rock bottom. The griftest shit ever. Universal disappointment. But this expansion digs a bit on the neoliberal status quo hellscape back to normal mentality that plagues this country. This expansion continues the nightmarish timeline with six new levels. March Against Dystopia, Dueling Protests, Top Island, Bicycle Bomber, Civil War, and Ancient Future. Here's a couple new enemies we got in this game. We got the Peace Police, Yellow Vested, Self-Appointed Protest Marshals, 
who will just as soon turn activists over the police if they get too confrontational or they start damaging property. Ultimately, they serve to protect the power instead of challenging it. We've also added a Robocop Digidog, and since release of this update, robots are now starting to become permitted to use deadly force, so that's worrisome. We got riot trucks, water cannons, and tanks now, you can hijack them too. Of course we threw in Dark Brandon as a boss now, and about how liberals want to make Biden based so much they made him an uber-authoritarian mishmash parody of far-right meme, Dark Maga, and Let's Go Brandon. But in Smash Mega, Dark Brandon turns on the anti-fascists just as soon as they dare challenge the dystopian police state, and he summons legions of ultra-liberals to take down the communists. The final showdown is an epic battle between the Trump virus and Dark Brandon in a post-apocalyptic fascist coliseum. Beat them both back in a three-way fight with an army of Antifa super soldiers. But don't just take it from us. Take it from our other special algorithmic guest. Yes, sir. With the specter of fascism haunting elections in the so-called United States, imminent system collapse is obvious to all. There is no future left but to fight it out in the chaos of the streets or in the latest version of Smash Mob, Trump Zombie Apocalypse. Join the struggle in single-player mode or fight alongside friends online. An emergency election is held, and both parties lose, without a majority or plurality. The internal contradictions prove too great for democracy to hold together the diverging realities. Ubiquitous political violence escalates to larger skirmishes. Regional conflicts spread to global theater. Mobbers succeeds under a familiar banner and makes the first strike. Civil war returns in the age of nuclear fascism. But another end of the world is possible, and while the capitalist ruling parties seek control, anarchy creates liberation. Join the growing networks of Antifa super soldiers and beat back the invading armies of fascism and oppression. See you in the streets, comrades. So yeah, if you're tired of the regular militaristic game scene, you know, uh, the Call of Duty, did you see the new Modern Warfare 2 got all this right-wing shit in it? Well, that wasn't bad enough. Fucking get a load of Kyle Rittenhouse. Yeah, this piece of shit made a piece of shit game. Some crappy Flash game where you shoot turkeys that's supposed to represent the fake news. What the fuck? What the fuck? Uh, oh, he released on Thanksgiving, of course, you know. And listen to this shit. Hi, I'm Kyle Rittenhouse. And my life was ruined by the fake news media. They called me a racist, they called me a murderer, and I am neither of those things. My reputation was destroyed by these fake news turkeys. Luckily, my good friend from Silicon Valley, the CEO of Mint Studios, Mint Chip, had a great idea. The Kyle Rittenhouse turkey shoot. That's right, Kyle. When I saw how these fake news turkeys operated, I had to start coding immediately. Gamers could play as Kyle Rittenhouse using a highly specialized laser gun to strike down any turkey that spreads lies, propaganda, or the bias. Everyone will get to see what Kyle has to cook for you each and every day. Really? Yup. We're not clucking around. Cluck, yeah. It's the fake news turkey shoot. Got a laser gun going through the TV. Follow my suit. One last set of frauds to address. I'm talking about Hector Monsiger, aka Sabu, the biggest rat in hacker history, and his corrupt handler at the FBI, Chris Tarbell looking like Kyle Rittenhouse. They're besties still, hilariously. Of course, they're the reason why I went to prison. Just listen to some of this shit from their new podcast, Hacker and the Fraud. Uh, we ended up arresting Sabu, and I lived with Sabu for the next nine months. The Kaiser Sose of hacking around then. Guy that was mystical on the internet and people feared him. Other hackers feared him. He would just get you. It was kind of the Wild West of the internet. This crazy Wild Wild West of the wild, wild west, which was the internet. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, you're deep in there, and you and you want to protect your own IP. So you needed to commit a crime in order to hide. Well, so the word informant here really isn't that good. Mm -hmm. It does. It's not fitting that that. Technically, I guess that's what he was. So there was a feeling of betrayal there, and I felt like, well, fuck it. You know, if, if that's the way they're going to play, then I'm going to I'm going to partake. I'm going to parlay rather. You didn't store logs of conversations of things going on. The reality is that rat bullshit is exactly that bullshit. You know, you can't you can't be part of a society where you know you want law and order and you want to fucking talk about oh my god the crime is going up, but then in your second breath you're like oh man these fucking rats are you know they're terrible stitches get stitches right. Yeah, he doesn't like the negative things said about him online. Would I do it again? Would I go back in time and do it again? Absolutely. 
Yeah, the day you graduate and walk out of the academy with a gun and a badge and, you know, the the power to charge someone with a misdemeanor for flying a United States flag at night, that's awesome. <laughs> I mean, I went through a huge funk when I did those cases afterwards. I should have talked to somebody, but in the FBI, you, you, you have to keep that machismo up or they're going to take your gun away from you. I really didn't want to give these cons any attention at all, but they crawled out of the slime with this new podcast, Hacker and the Fed explaining the ironic novelty of their sick relationship. Tarbell been on a campaign mode these days, shilling his new crypto cybersecurity firm, Naxo. He also appeared on two larger podcasts this month, Lex Friedman and Anthony Pompliano. First off, these podcasters, these crypto libertarian dweebs, these guys are hacks. Pompliano, some ex-military crypto life coach, he was just pumping FTX and BlockFi, both of which just tanked. What a fraud. Lex, some intellectually brought on Elon Musk twice, Zuckerberg, Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, even some UFO stuff. But anyways, so yeah, thanks a lot, you assholes, bringing on the guy who busted us. Both of them were like, I'm interested in both sides, but you didn't bother to reach out or reach out to Ross or any of his people who is still in prison because of Tar Bell. You just let him talk about us, let him lie, which is the same problem how most corporate media covers the police. They just repeat the official police narrative as truth, they didn't bother to look into our cases because any half-assed attempt on the facts and circumstances you would have thought, maybe these guys aren't credible guests. But no, they didn't even give any pushback either. Of course, they didn't talk about any of the rampant corruption, informant misconduct, entrapment. Sabu and Tarbell don't talk much about any of the exact specifics of what all went down during this cooperation, even though all the logs are out there. We're not going to get into all the details here, but you could check it out. It's at the Sabu files. It just proves the hypocrisy of the whole cybercrime program. Clearly shows how Tarbell and Monsiger were complicit with facilitating and orchestrating hundreds of attacks, not just here, but against other countries. But no, they're the good guys, the white hats cleaning up the wild, wild west. But they're doing the same shit they say any of us did, but way more. And that's how it played out in our case. Tarbell was also all proud telling his version of the story, working the Silk Road case like it was all cool, like he isn't just some tool in the failed war on drugs. They didn't talk about how the case was all riddled with corruption, didn't bother to mention that literally two federal agents were caught embezzling millions in Bitcoin from evidence. He wants to talk about selling baby parts and murder for hire without mentioning that ridiculous FBI informant staged murder plot was all thrown out. Nobody died, but Ross is doing life without the possibility of parole because of him. And when asked whether he thought the sentence was too harsh, take a look. Um, mm -hmm. I was surprised by the sentence, but again, it's not for me to pass judgment. That's, you know, that, that wasn't my job. My, mm -hmm. my job was to bring him to justice. And then the jury and the judge comes up with the, 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 the with guilty or not in the, in the sentencing. Maybe you don't have an opinion on like, is the sentence appropriate or is it not? Right. Like, that's like, I certainly don't have a public opinion. I yeah. mean, I have opinions. Okay. You want to share it? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's funny, huh? I don't know why any of these crypto assholes would have any respect for this guy because Ross is one of their heroes still doing double life because this piece of shit cooking the books. Here he is also talking shit about Snowden. A good or a bad person? A bad person. There's ways of being a whistleblower and, and there's there's rules set up on how to do that. Um, he, he didn't follow those rules. I mean, they, they you know, I'm red, white, and blue, so I, I'm pretty, you know, there's rules in place for a reason. I mean, he put, you know, some of our best capabilities, um, he made them publicly available. Um, they really kind of set us back in the, and this isn't my world at all, but the offensive side of, of cyber security. Of course, he mad that Snowden exposed that the feds were doing all this mass surveillance abuse. It's believed Tarbell was doing the whole NSA parallel construction thing himself, illegally laundering their evidence in secret. No wonder he's always complaining how when they catch somebody, they've got to reveal their methods, you know, basic due process rights. Lex also asked about Open Information Access champion Aaron Swartz, who was literally prosecuted to death by Tarbell's colleagues. Check this out. So it's tough. It's a tough case. I mean, the, the, the outcome was tragic, obviously. Um, he, 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 unfortunately, when you're in law enforcement, you have to, your job is to enforce the laws. I mean, it is not, if, if you're told that you have to do a certain case, you know, and there is a violation of, at the time, you know, 18 USC 10, 1030, uh, computer hacking, um, you have to press forward with that. That's fucking cold. Some Nuremberg type shit. You're really just some next level hacker enemy number one or something, huh? Now here they are trying to ingratiate themselves back in the scene, representing themselves as security professionals and technologists like they didn't just betray everybody. Sabu and Tarbell, this is the thing now, going to these little C-rate security conferences, performing this corny bit, this reformed black hat leader now working as a professional, a lifetime friendship with the Fed who busted him, 
and everyone else too with his help. How inspiring. You could book them for tens of thousands of dollars a gig, but he wouldn't dare show up at no big thing like he wouldn't dare try Hope or DEF CON. It's hard to imagine anyone with legit hacker credibility would let them hang. No, he does these sad little product launches, a trucking conference. I talked shit on Twitter once and he got kicked off Secure Miami. Anyways, one time he came here to Chicago to speak at this amped thing, some customer service suit and tie thing I saw advertised on Twitter. I wasn't going to go or make a big deal of it, but I just fucking showed up. I just walked right in, not even hiding myself, looking obvious as fuck, drinking your coffee, talking to your colleagues, got some promotional Zoom socks and hand towels till security kicked me out. I guess he didn't want me to see his little routine. <laughs> it's a little too much. <laughs> That's funny too. So this rat bastard doing this weekly podcast now, hacker in the Fed, calling himself the leader of anonymous, telling fake ass war stories, also doing whole episodes telling lies and excuses why he snitched, but framing it like some redemption story. Who he had to accept the consequences, and he's now made it as this white hat security professional. It's the most pathetic thing I've ever heard. And that you're doing a podcast with the FBI guy who busted everyone, like that's some sick shit. Can you believe that apparently they were even living together when they were working our case? I just found this out. I think that would have been useful to know while I was fighting my case. Anyway, Sabu is like a case study of what not to do when the police come. So first off, he's not even like a hacker, right? No skill. He clicked a link to somebody else's back door someone dropped in the chat from his home IP address. And he was the first one busted. But the FBI didn't even have a warrant or anything yet. They had to show up at his door because they were scared that maybe he was going to run because he had just been doxxed by somebody else. Anyways, when the feds come, you're supposed to shut the fuck up. Hell, he wasn't even under arrest. They didn't have a warrant or anything. Really, they blessed him by giving him a heads up. He could have gotten a lawyer. He could have warned us. No. Instead, he starts ratting immediately. It's only after he confesses did they charge him with a dozen counts, which is standard for informants. He pleads guilty in the first week, knowing he would never get anything remotely close to the maximum consecutive 125 years. He would have just gotten a couple years, just like the rest of us. So stop it with this 125 years shit. He only ended up doing a couple months because he fucked up his bail. They told him to be silent online, but he couldn't help running his mouth. But also because he was bragging to some cop outside his spot about how he's an FBI agent. And they arrested him for impersonating an officer. What a fool. They ended up granting him bail a second time. And eventually he gets time served. Judge Preska thanks him. The prosecutor hugs him. I'll go to prison for years. We will never forgive or forgive that shit. Look, I got the whole story. But we're not going to waste any more time on this right now. It's just funny to see how these fakes fit in with all that we've talked about today. Now that they're popping up again and probably will continue to embarrass them themselves with this show for the foreseeable future. So the struggle continues. Despite them, Anonymous still doing its thing, hackers and leakers. It's another golden era, really. There's been skirmishes. The FBI is on a warpath, too. Always bad faith actors in the tech space. They just put out a statement urging big tech companies, specifically Apple, to build government backdoors into their cloud encryption. Also last month, the FBI made two arrests and took down Z Library, the popular book sharing site. But you can still get to it on the dark web. And as we go to press, someone hacked InfraGuard, the FBI's flagship cybercrime partnership program. Remember, we hit them several times ourselves. It never gets sold. And so they're selling the membership list of some 80,000 feds on a dark web market. The lulls are still alive and well.
Conclusions, or ending the grift economy. In the past, the consequences of collapse were not distributed equally amongst all peoples. Presently, it's a utopia for some and a dystopia for others. But it's all borrowed time. Crypto-fascism is most definitely a threat to any future on this planet. Centralization, monetization, privatization, incarceration, militarization, automation, acceleration, and annihilation. The vision of these rich edgelords in control of the wheel has put some in a bunker and you a number. They are telling you who they are. They want to strip the earth of all life for the resources. And when there's nothing left, they will manifest destiny onto the next planet, bringing with them the same old, failed, racist, sexist, classist ideologies, like a plague. We say fuck all that. Unplug. Touch grass. We don't need this fascist crypto thing. Both the political parties are failing, that's plain to see. With the vacuum of power right now comes the hate grifters. All out there acting fools for your attention, creeping in and preying on the uncertainty of the moment, taking advantage of the dark age of disinfo they created, programming you while eroding the shared sense of collective or consensus reality. We're past the point where you can justify one's participation in the zeitgeist of rising fascism and apocalyptic capitalism with claims of individual neutrality, excuses of ignorance, or the perceived inability to change things. We can stop all this. We can change everything. But only if we are absolutely clear where we stand and we lay down the line in the sand. Wherever you're at, stand up against this shit and build something different. Creo que ahora sí se aclaró este pensamiento mío. Lo que el rico nos robó regresará aunque tardío. Todo rifle proletario con un buen apuntador debe tener en la mira siempre algún explotador. Y la soga campesina debe estar alrededor del cuello latifundista que asesina al labrador. Esto se llama justicia, mírelo de donde lo mire, para acabar con la avaricia, 